All right, we live. Y'all can start sharing the links right now before we get started. All right. We on Sarnia the Studios. Let me see. Yeah, let's start. All right, we live. Y'all can start sharing the links right now before we get started. All right. Still don't see it. Really. Yeah, it probably got to give you some, give it time to come up. You know what? It still got the cover of Lord Abbott and Reggie, but I'm getting ready to change that right now. Yeah, that's probably what it is. Just look for live. Look for the one that say live. And you're going to see it's a cover with Lord Abbott and Reggie, but I just changed it. Peace and Black Power family. How y'all doing today? You know today is our second day. The, the debate week is going down. If you're conscious and awake and wait, you heard about Sarnetter TV. If you're conscious, why you hating? Hate. Some of us think too small, just too afraid to fall. If you're conscious and awake and wait, you know that the studio is deep. Black news and history in the making. Man. Let's get up from the fall. What's up and take it all. All right. Peace and black power family. You already know what it is. The day is the second day of the debate week is going down. And you see who we got in front of us. We got Gorilla Hebrew and Bro Sanchez family. This is going to be powerful. Gorilla Hebrew versus Brother Sanchez. Is the Bible really prophecy or just good planning? That's one of the topics that we're going to be discussing today. And the second one will be is the Bible really prophecy or just good planning? Damn, I like that one. And the last one will be which creation story is more accurate? The Genesis creation story with the God of the Bible or the great mother goddess concept of the cosmos. Great topics, man. So we're going to get into that right now. And uh, each one of you brothers have 10 minutes apiece, Gorilla Hebrew. I'm going to allow you to go first, but I want you to give them two minutes of what are you going to be doing right now, brother? I want you to give an opening argument, an opening statement here on what you're going to be doing and what you're here to prove today. Go ahead, it's on you, brother. Yeah, well, of course, I, I greet everybody with shalom and, of course, give all praises, honor, and glory unto the Most High God, Yahweh. I do so in the name of His only begotten Son, who the world calls Christ, Yahweh Shai. And what we're here to do today um, is discuss, firstly, uh, what basically is black people believing in the Bible more beneficial for white people or is it more beneficial for black people? Um, it's an interesting question uh, that the brothers coming with, man, and I, I, I like to just stick to the data. That's my thing. Um, at the end of the day, we can't argue with the facts. Uh, the proof is in the pudding, so to speak. So I just want to sh show data that's going to, you know, reinstill my argument and justify my position in it. I think a lot of times our people get caught up on too many hypotheticals. You know what I mean? Like uh, I just had an argument over the weekend about would the 01 Lakers beat the 95 Bulls, you know? And I mean, to me, it's not even a question. Of course the Bulls will win, you know what I mean? But when people have opinions and, oh, I feel this way, or somebody has a, um affinity towards certain players for whatever reason, a lot of times our people had that bias. We need to lose them biases and just take a look at the raw data and the information. And, you know, a lot of times people look at Hebrew Israelites like we're without raw data and information. So that's a, a common misconception that I'd also uh, plan to venture to disprove tonight. I'm just going to get a look at the data and the information and let, let the proof be in the pudding, let it speak for itself. And, you know, people who, uh, operate not out of emotion, but out of fact, are going to see what it is, man. So that's what we've been trying to do. Uh, Thank today. you. The spirit of power of the most high. 
Thank you, brother. Brother Sanchez, go ahead. Open the argument, brother. Yeah, let me give a shout out to you and Gorilla Hebrew and to everybody in the chat room. Uh, like Sonnet always say, who's really going to win this debate is the people. And I think this is one of those things where if Gorilla Hebrew want to say the Bible, Black people believing in the Bible is more beneficial to them than whites, we can ask the question also later on, if Black people believing in the Quran is more beneficial to Blacks or let's say Middle Easterners. I think the point that I'm gonna try to make in my debate, because I was a Christian, is to prove without a shadow of a doubt that you know the Bible does benefit whites more than Blacks, but I'm gonna be using a couple of scriptures from the Bible to show that. I think mm -hmm. a lot of our people don't understand the concept of manifest destiny. So I'm gonna be kind of touching on that a little bit and how it relates to the Bible. Um, one thing I will say though, yes, I'm in opposition to the Bible. I think it's detrimental to the people, but I never would make an argument that it hasn't took some murderers and killers off the streets and made them into Christian men. You know what I'm saying? Point. That's, yeah. that's, that's not my argument today. Overall, as a people, is does it does this book help my people get to their destination where we need to be? And I think that's the main part about it, as opposed to a few people may have changed in their lives. The majority of us is just, you know, messed up. So I'm dealing with the majority, not the minority today. And that's where I stand. All right. Thank you. So this is going to be a respectful debate. This is not about attacking nobody character. This is not about insulting nobody. Whoever does that, I will be taking off time. So you don't want your time to get cut. We want to keep it respectful. The people are here for the knowledge and the information. So let's do good by giving them that. Okay, so Brother Gorilla, the time will start when you start, brother. The time will start when you start. How do I, uh, how do I share my screen on here? Um, go to the bottom and something should pop up and you should see where it says share. You see okay, it? Sure. Okay, yeah, I see share. Sure. Click on, open up your, open up what you want to share first, and then you're going to see it. Click on that box. There you go. All right, let me know when you're ready. All right. All right, I'm ready. All right, time starts. All right, again, I give all praise to the most high. So, of course, this section is going to be about who benefits more from black people living in the Bible, blacks or whites, right? So the first thing I'm going to show here is the cover of the slave Bible, right? So it says select parts of the Holy Bible uh, for the use of the Negro slaves British West Indian, in the British West Indian Islands, right? Ooh, I can't, hold on, so, there we go. All right, so it says the slave Bible is a Bible specifically edited for slaves. Its actual title was parts of the Holy Bible selected for the use of Negro slaves in the British West India Islands. They were produced in England in the early 19th century. Uh, my fault. Move this over for use in the British West Indies when they were colonies of the British Empire. Such Bibles had all references to freedom and escape from slavery excised, while passages incurring, encouraging obedience and submission were emphasized. Right? So, if they want us to believe in the Bible, that's something that they wanted us to do. Why would they give us a Bible with most of it taken out? Didn't they take parts out on purpose so we wouldn't know it? Because if we knew those parts, we wouldn't believe in the doctrine that they spoon fed us, proving the Bible isn't what they wanted us to believe in. What they wanted us to believe in was the religious ideology that they were feeding us, not the scriptures. Because when certain brothers got a hold of the Bible, i.e. Nat Turner, and he started actually seeing what was in there and going against what was being spoon fed into him, it inspired revolution. It inspired him to want to seek independence in a land of his own. See, so it, it's not about the Bible. Now you can say that about religion. We don't benefit from the Christian ideological religion that's been founded and that we've been indoctrinated with and I'm gonna further gonna prove, but you can't blame that on the Bible, right? I'm gonna further expound on why. Here's why, let's just take a look at all these things that they taught us, right? In, in Christianity, in the religions that are directly against the Bible to further prove that they never really wanted us to believe in the Bible. They wanted us to believe in their religion, right? For example, Christmas is forbidden in Jeremiah 10. Cutting the tree out of the forest, putting it in your house and decorating it. God says, do not learn this way. Yet when you went to church, the reason why all of us, all of our families still do that to this day is because you learned that at church. We didn't just make that up. 
You learn that at church. Why would the church tell you to do something that is directly against what the Bible is telling you to do if they, in fact, wanted you to believe and learn in the Bible? See, it's not about the Bible at all. They are literally purposely deceiving you and causing you to do things against the Bible for their benefit. They don't want you to believe in the Bible for their benefit, right? The Bible describes Jesus as black. They taught us he was white. The Bible told you, they told you God loved everybody. In 1 Kings 10, the only time where it says God loves anybody, it's to Israel. That's the only time he ever expresses love to anybody is to Israel, right? In church, they tell you Satan is God's rival. You go to the book of Job, Satan is taking orders from God. They tell you got free will in the church. You go to Romans 8 and tell you we all predestined. Why would they teach us things contrary to the Bible if that's what they wanted us to believe in for their benefit? No, for their benefit, they entrapped us in religion, not in the scriptures, right? Let me go further. This is a picture of a man. His name is Ben Ami Carter, right? Now, I heard what the brother said, um, dealing with, we're not talking about individuals because like all type of things, you could go to the Nation of Islam, the Quran, Buddhist. I mean, there's every ideology in the world has probably helped one brother somewhere stop becoming a, a detrimental weapon of mass destruction to his own community through one mechanism or another. I'm with him there. We're not just talking about isolated incidents. I'm not going to talk about just what it's done for me and how it stopped me from being how I was. We looking at larger groups of people, right? So this has been on me, Carter, right? Now, Ben Ami, through belief in the Bible, he successfully repatriated thousands of people from America to Africa and Israel. What's interesting is what he, the brother, bro, brother Sanchez made the statement, what's going to get us to our destination? Well, whether you believe the destination is Africa or Israel, Ben Ami took people from America and got us back to both. To this day, has successful communities set up in Liberia, Nigeria, Ghana, and Israel thriving with our people, right? Name me anyone from the list of who's who, who are not Bible believers that accomplished this. Marcus Garvey and the UNIA and how much he's venerated, and I'm not saying anything against the brother, but he talked about taking us back to Africa and he didn't do it. But this brother Ben Ami did it and he did it through his belief in the Bible. His belief in the Bible led him to take thousands of black people from America, from the hills and the ghettos of America, and bring them into successful and peaceful communities in Africa and in Israel. And this is after he's died, these things still stand. That's why I say the proof is in the pudding. It's a lot of people that have came with a back to Africa ideology, even Israelites that say the hell with Africa, we're supposed to go to Israel. Guess what this brothers did? He's taken our people to both. And he did it all through belief in the Bible. Right? Let's keep going. Right? In the people's village in Demona, Israel, there has never been a murder. Right? They established this in 1970. In 50 years, there has never been a murder there. And there is thousands of black people living there. Right? There has never been a crack rock smoke in 50 years. There has never been an abortion in 50 years. There is not opioid abuse there in 50 years. There's no AIDS there. In 50 years, since 1970, is that is, is the Bible benefited enough for you yet? When these bro this brother took his belief in the Bible to take thousands of people to set up communities abroad, and in these communities, no one's ever killed somebody. No one's ever sold nobody's pregnant girlfriend a crack rock. It's never happened. Nobody's ever aborted a black baby before it ever had a chance. Nobody ever contracted AIDS. But it's not, but you know, it ain't it, that beneficial to us. When we actually take it, and read it for what it says and follow it and implement it in our lives like our brother Ben Ami Carter did, Ben Ami Ben Israel did, and still does even in his death through the work that he's done and the knowledge that he's implanted in brothers and the communities he set up. Because I'm talking about the communities abroad, but he has rich communities right here in America, in Chicago, in Atlanta, right now, black businesses and things like that that are set up that fund all of these operations healthcare, all these things. I know, I'm not just talking from any experience. I personally know these individuals. I build with them. I just was with them about a month and a half, two months ago, right? So in all of this, in all the communities he set up, none of these problems, some of the main problems that have ravished and destroyed our communities have plagued. And it's not just was a couple hundred, a cult of a couple hundred. No, these, there are tens of thousands of our brothers and sisters that are a part of this across the world. And they don't have, and they're not plagued by the same issues that we're plagued with here. And again, that's all because they separated themselves from the wilds of this world, isolated themselves, and subjugated themselves exclusively to the law, statute, commandments in the Bible, man. Right? Let's keep going.
1970, between 1970 to now, there's been over 200,000 black on black murders in America. Again, there hasn't been one in any of their communities. Millions of black babies aborted in America, zero in Demona. So you ask again, why? Belief in the Bible. Belief in the Bible has led successful groups of thousands of black people to this place of seeming tranquility where they're not killing each other. They don't have that same evil eye to, to each other. They're practicing group economics. They actually, and what a lot of people don't know is the school they have in Demona, the education system that they built in the people's village is so good that those white Jewish people actually pay to send their kids to school there. This is what black people have actually been able to do when they removed themselves from the church's ideological system and actually began to follow the Bible. Imagine if we did this in mass the way they, these brothers did it. They've already proven to do it amongst tens of thousands. Imagine a hundred thousand, imagine a million subjugated themselves like this. I at least have data that suggests that it's possible and it's more beneficial than any other thing. You can come to me with any hypotheticals you want anything from 2,000, 3,000, 200 years ago you want. I've got real results right now in the last 50 years and for the last 50 years that suggest that the Bible is beneficial and very easy to implement amongst groups of our people to invoke immediate change. It changed unlike we've ever seen, change that eliminates black on black murder. Come on now, man, right? So again, I'm gonna close with this. The proof is in the pudding, like I said at the start and all praise to the most high. I don't need the rest of my time. I'm good. All right, man. Powerful, powerful start off, my brother, Gorilla Hebrew. Uh, we coming up with you, my brother Sanchez. Who benefits the most from the Bible? Blacks or whites, my brother? Time will start when you start. Ten minutes in this, in this round. So I guess I'll sacrifice a minute to rebuttal one thing he said before I get into my actual debate. Okay. Um, no, your rebuttal come next if you want to. So you ain't got to sacrifice. So you your rebuttal round come right after he rebuttal. But if you want to do it, that's on your time. You okay. Do what okay. you do. All right. Time will start when you start. All right. So one thing I'll say then is that um, these revolutionaries didn't believe in the Bible. They believed in themselves, my brother. If, if Marcus Garvey never believed in himself, he can believe in the Bible all he want and nothing would have happened. If Harriet Tubman didn't have belief in herself, she would have sat around waiting for Jesus to bring her salvation. You, these people clearly believed in themselves and that was their inspiration because they, if they had believed in the Bible, they would have waited around for Jesus to bring them that salvation. They believed in themselves and took it in their own hands. They took their salvation in their own hands and they failed. Now, let me say this too. Most slaveholders, at least more than half, if you were to ask them how would they define themselves, they would have said as Bible believers. So, or Christian, but let me state that the word Christian means something different to us all. To me, a Christian just means a Bible believer. I want to be clear on that so we can understand who we're dealing with here. He's a Bible believer, Gorilla Hebrew. He's a Bible believer. So we want to know who we're dealing with. When I say Christian, the simple definition is Bible believer. And um, with that being said, I just made the word Christian an umbrella for every school of thought that's founded upon a belief in the Bible. So now it ain't no wiggle room. So like I said, the slave masters identified as Christians or Bible believers they actually sung songs, gospel music, while they was hanging you from trees and burning you alive and stuff like that. So when you think of all the horrible atrocities that our ancestors went through, you got to keep in mind that the people who brought forth those atrocities defined themselves as Bible believers because it was the Bible that condoned their actions. Most of us don't have the heart, for example, to throw a child to an alligator because we got a consciousness. But when you have a book that you listen to before you listen to the conscious voice in your heart that's supposed to help and direct your actions and guide your judgment, well, then it becomes easier to justify these kind of genocidal acts and do them without guilt as long as the book says it's okay or if, you, or if the action is done in the name of some God. Especially if that God himself was responsible for punishing kids with pestilence and plague 
See, this is why all the war and genocide that shaped history was founded upon world religions. Remember, people pray to their gods before bombing villages and killing women and children. When you think about everything I've said those thus far, when we ask the question who benefits the most from blacks believing in the Bible, blacks or whites, it's answered by the question who benefits the most from slavery, blacks or whites. We know whites benefit the most from slavery or servitude. The Bible is not only a book that lays out the guidelines of slavery, servitude, and manifest destiny. It also has built within it the very poetry that allowed the slave master to commit the most wicked acts that could be committed against another human and free themselves from all guilt. For example, in simple scriptural texts such as 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18, it reads, slaves in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. This type of doctrine not only frees a harsh slave master from his guilt, no matter how harsh he may have treated the slave, it also teaches the slave to accept the mistreatment from the harsh slave master. And it feeds the slave a type of psychosis that will make him pray to the same God that sanctioned the mistreatment to help him endure it versus a doctrine that would make him devise a plan of rebellion and escape. Check. We all know that turning the other cheek benefits the person who's doing the slapping more than the person receiving the damn slap. And as none he can say to convince me otherwise, folks. So ain't going to be no twisting and misinterpreting scripture with this one, because at the end of the day, if, if both the slave and the slave owner are being spiritually led by the same book, then it's irrelevant how the slave interprets it, since his interpretation will never make him a slave master. No matter how the slave interprets it, it would always conclude with him being the one that's turning the other cheek and never the one that's doing the damn smacking. So just like the Bible benefits the God of the Bible more than it benefits his servants, it also benefits the masters of those held in servitude more than the slave or the servant. The God of the Bible rules over his servants with fear, torture, famine, pestilence, and plague. So likewise, the slave master does the same because the same book that teaches him how to be a good slave master also teaches the slave how to be a good slave. Let me move on here. In Ephesians verse one, chapter five through seven, it says, servants be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God, uh, as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, he sh the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. First Timothy, first Timothy chapter six, verse one. All, all who are under the yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of full respect so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. Colossians chapter three, verse 22. Slaves obey your earthly masters and everything and do it not only when their eyes on you and to carry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. The Bible is what taught us how to be good slaves. Clearly this type of rhetoric benefits the slave master more than the slave, but the problem is that Hebrew Israelites find their pride in being the chosen people of God. Since the chosen people of God were said to be slaves, it's easy to find pride in being a slave just to say you're chosen by God but chosen to do what? You was chosen to pick cotton and plow fields. And when you look at, like, look at it like that, shit, I'd rather be unchosen by God and live as a free man. I'd rather be not chosen by God if you telling me God chose me to be hung, castrated, uprooted, and to have my true identity taken away from it. Exodus chapter 21, verse one through four. The biblical God lays out more guidelines, rules, and regulations in, in, in Exodus chapter 21, verse one through four. Let's read it and see who these regulations benefit the most. Now these are the rules that you shall set before them. When you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh, he shall go, go out free for nothing. Meaning you're gonna work seven years with no, for, for free. If he comes in single, he shall go out single. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. 
if his master give him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters and he shall go out alone. In, in this verse, we can see the type of biblical indoctrination adopted by the slave masters that led to the psychology of manifest destiny, creating today's racial wealth gap. You work for free. And while those very small amount of people at the top of the world's financial pyramid hoard hundreds of trillions of dollars that pass on to their future generations, while most people of the earth live off less than a dollar a day. We don't create generational wealth, we create more and more generational debt and at exponential rates on top of that. See, this type of indoctrination explains why the temples we pray in are worth more than the houses we live in. And why as the generational wealth gap increases, so does the prayers from the slaves. This type of indoctrination explains why the people who pray the most suffer the most and why those who cause the suffering pray with us because they pray on us. In other words, the slave and the slave master pray to the same God, but who benefits the most? The slave master, because through prayer, the slave gains the strength to endure the slavery, but never to escape it. Let me say that again. Through prayer, the slave gains the strength to endure his slavery, but never to escape it. Through the prayer, the same God that tells the slave to endure the slavery also tells the slave master to perpetuate it. In verse four, we can see the type of biblical indoctrination adopted by the slave masters that led to them breaking up the family. And while most of the fathers are not in the household, while most of us grew up in single mother households, we just read the scripture right there in uh, chapter 21, verse one through four in the book of Exodus. And you'll see why our homes is broken up. This is their doctrine that they're going by. They're not randomly controlling the world. They plant this shit which is gonna get into prophecy verse planning on the next argument. But who benefit most from all this? The slave masters, because with the man out of the household, there's no warrior present to instill the spirit of warriorhood into the offspring. And if the spirit of warriorhood is not instilled into the offspring, the slave masters can rid themselves of any and all future rebellions, threats, and or true messiahs that would arise. Also remember, the biblical God sometimes require his servants to willingly offer up their children uh, for human sacrifice. And the slave masters who adopted that same psychology indoctrinate us to willingly make the same sacrifice to them by offering up our children for war and industry. So poor kids die in wars funded by the rich and their parents are proud because they were sacrificed for their country, which essentially is their God. The next scripture ties everything together by proving that the slave master's mindset comes from the slave master's God. Colossians chapter four, verse one says, masters provide your slaves with what is right and fair because you know that you also have a master in heaven. What we got to realize Tom, is that brother, the angel- Tom. Okay, okay, cool, Yo, Do you cool, hear that? Cool. Do you hear this? No, I don't hear it. You heard that, Gorilla? Oh, I do hear it. I hear that. You hear that, Gorilla Hebrew? Oh, Gorilla Hebrew is busy, right? No, yeah. Oh, that's probably why y'all didn't stop. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, but I, didn't, I didn't hear it if you played it while okay. he was talking. Okay, so family, I really like the way this joint is starting off, man. I'm definitely interested in this. Let me let y'all know tomorrow is really going down tomorrow. We got Zion Lex going up against Ngozi. Two more powerful heavy hitters, y'all. You do not, I repeat, you do not want to miss this one right here. Two heavy hitters, Ngozi versus Zion Lex. Civilization or Nile Valley civilization. Which civilization is older? But of course, you know they're going to go into more stuff. This is going to be a powerful, powerful showdown. We already know Ngozi goes all into the E1, B1, A, and oh, woo, I just can't wait to tomorrow for this one. Oh, man. But this joint that we got right now is also powerful, family. The, um, it starts at seven o'clock. Brother, one thing I like about what these brothers is doing right now, I seen Sanchez writing it down and taking notes. I seen brother Gorilla Hebrew writing down and taking notes. That's when you know a brother is serious. When you see a brother talking and ain't nobody writing down nothing, y'all not taking this damn debate serious. But when you got both of these brothers writing down and making sure you got a, you know, counter rebut, that's serious right there. So, brother, Gorilla Hebrew, 
The time will start when you start. You got 10 minutes to rebut in this same round. We still in the first round. Who benefits the most from the Bible? Blacks, excuse me, or whites? Time will start when you start, brother. Perfect, perfect. All right. Yeah, so again, all praise to you. I respect. So uh, what the brother did was, of course, like I said, if you spoon feed people a doctrine and an ideology, like I already spoke on, like they did with the slave Bibles, where they purposely only left verses like that in there, but not other verses, you can try to twist the narrative, but that's not the Bible in its totality, and that cannot be blamed on the Bible. That's blamed on the individual that's spoon feeding. And what's funny is you're saying the regulation, uh, 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 the regulations there benefit the slave master more than the slave, but the regulations there are not saying that this is for white people okay to do with black people. So black people can take that same thing and do it to white people, right? So it, there's no uh, anything in the scriptures that's telling you, yes, white people can do this to black people. So that's why it's none and void for you to even bring it up in this situation. Because truthfully, when we read those scriptures, they're addressed to the children of Israel. White people identify themselves as Gentiles. So how are they utilizing any of that truthfully and honestly as a justification to do anything when by their own admission, it's not written to them? That doesn't even make sense. That's, I mean, really, it's, it's purely rhetoric. The, oh, the, what I always use, a great example is, a screwdriver is made for tightening screws and taking screws out. I can use a screwdriver and I can fix my cabinet. I can use a screwdriver and I can steal your car. I can use your screwdriver and I can kill somebody. But what was the screwdriver made for? The screwdriver was made to tighten screws and loosen screws, right? Now, if an individual takes that screwdriver, that tool, and utilizes it something for what it's outside of its initial purpose, that's not on the screwdriver. That's on the individual that took it and misused it. So you went into plenty of scriptures right, which the white man isolated and put in the slave Bible. But here's the scriptures that they took out of the slave Bible. Here's the scriptures that inspired Nat Turner. What's funny is you tried to, this brother tried to null and void the fact that Nat Turner and Harriet Tubman were avid Bible believers. There's no getting around that. And believing in yourself does not negate belief in the Bible. There's no way. If you believe that you can do it, you can believe that you can do something and still believe in the Bible. It, it's, it's asinine to try to say that one negates the other at all. We both know what the inspiration behind both of them was the Holy Bible. There, first off, uh, uh, Harriet Tubman's ancestors are full-fledged Hebrew Israelites who talk about her having a Hebrew name and her identifying herself as a Hebrew Israelite. So that's unnegatable, brother. But let's go to the Bible. Let's go to these verses that were taken out. And once you begin to contextualize things, you see that just what you did is just what the white men did, misused the tool that was provided to them. So now let's go to... Uh, Leviticus 18 to 21. He, Because he, number one, before I even get to anything else, he lied on God and said, God said it's cool to sacrifice your babies or he requires people to kill their babies and sacrifice them to God. That is an outright lie. Leviticus 18 to 21. And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord. Uh, Leviticus 20 and 2. Again, thou shalt say to the children of Israel, so he's re-emphasizing it, Whosoever he be of the children of Israel or of the strangers that should journey in Israel that give any of his seed unto Molech, sacrifice his babies to this God, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. The Bible say if you kill or sacrifice your baby, you got to die. So you outright lie, brother. Anyway, Acts 2 and 40. Right, because he said, Yeah, the, if they believed in the Bible, they wouldn't have saved themselves, they'd have been waiting on God. Let's see what the Bible says, Acts 2 and 40. And with many other words, did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves. Did it say, Wait? No, it says, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. So the Bible told you to save yourself. So believing in the Bible does not make you wait on the Savior, the Bible tells you to save yourself. First Timothy 4 and 16. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Meaning, if you properly are teaching the scriptures, you are going to know to save yourself and you're going to teach other people to do the same thing. Directly contrary to the statements that you made. Obadiah 1 and, uh, 1 and 21. And saviors, plural. Not wait on a savior. It says saviors, plural. It's referring to the men of Israel as saviors. Shall come upon Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, I mean, to have a revolution against their arch nemesis, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. 
It says saviors, people who saved, not people who waited, people who saved shall do this. So that totally puts your ideology out of the window that the Bible tells you that not to save yourself. Clearly three witnesses telling you verbatim that Israelite men are saviors and directing us explicitly to save ourselves. Luke 17 and four. And if he trespass against thee, Salakia, that ain't it. That ain't the scripture I'm looking for. I'm gonna skip past that. Was it 17 and four that you gave me? 21, my fault, I put it in wrong. 21, one second. Luke 17 to 21, let's see what Christ said, the world called Christ, Yahweh shot. Neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Christ never taught us that the kingdom of God was some place that we had to go for, you know, or some place we had to die to go to. He said it's within us. That means we have the power to manifest it. It's also why other scriptures talk about saving yourselves. When you actually get into what the scriptures say, it's contrary to what has been spoon fed. And you cannot blanket all Bible believers as Christians because everyone that believe in the Bible is not a Christian. There's Muslims that believe in the Bible. They're not Christians. You see what I'm saying? There's five percent of use the Bible. There's people who've never been to church in their whole life and do not follow any of the tenets of Christianity. And they believe in the Bible. The actual definition of, of, of being involved in Christianity means to accept the Trinity as a primary, as your Christological position. That Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. If you do not accept that, you're not a Christian by definition. So you cannot blanket all Bible believers as Christians. That's also improper, and that's not going to work to engage further because you're misidentifying people and you're blanketing people under um, a, a, a false assumption, right? Even a, even the majority of the scriptures you went to are broke down on a false assumption were broke down just like the white man broke it down. But if you look at those scriptures in context, not even in the just look at the original language it was written in. It don't say nothing about a slave obeying his master. It's talking about being subordinate in the churches. It has nothing to do with no matter how many days, times a day you get whipped, you have to take it. Just look at it contextually. It's dealing with being subordinate to church leadership. That simple. Going to keep going, though. Right. Let's see if it's OK to enslave people, according to the Bible. Right. Just to do what they did. The chattel slavery that we experienced in the transatlantic slave trade. Exodus 21 to 16. Right. And he that stealeth a man and selleth him. Or if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. If you steal somebody, like we were stolen from the shores of West Africa, and you sell the person, the person who did that got to die. That's what the law of God says. But, of course, this wasn't in the slave Bible. This was never taught. Of course, our brother Sanchez didn't read this because it does not coincide with any of these ideologies. It does not coincide with the white man's agenda. So, of course, they try to leave this part out, but it's right here in the Bible. And if you actually opened it, unamended and read it for yourself, you would see things like this and realize, wait a minute. Yeah, they twisted something up because this is pretty plain right here. If you steal somebody and sell them or you steal somebody and you're found with them before you sell them, you got to die. And it says a man, right? And you have to understand when you go into the Torah law, sometimes it'll say you can't do this to your neighbor or you can't do this to your brother. That's regulations that Israelites can't do to each other. But anytime you see where it says a man, that's something you can't do to another man, period. It don't matter if he's an Israelite or any other nation under the sun. That is something you cannot do to them. You can't just go around stealing human beings. You will die for that. You should die for that. That's what God said, right? So we can't just brush past these scriptures just because we're doing the same thing that the white Christian and the slave master has done and isolating these. We got to balance these things out, right? If, if the best you could say is they cancel each other out, but if they cancel each other out, then what does that mean? That means your point is nothing more, right? So let's keep going. Uh, Psalm 72 and 4. Let's see if they left this in the slave Bible. He shall judge the poor of the people, the poor people. He shall save the children of the needy and shall break in pieces the oppressor. The Bible say the oppressor got to be broken to pieces. Not uphold him and praise him and worship him and he's all good. No, he needs to be broken in pieces, Right? And I'm in with this. Second Thessalonians 1 and 6, it says, seeing it is a righteous thing. It's a good thing. It's a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Recompense means to pay back in full. What, who has gone through more trouble the last 500 years than our people? Right? God said it's righteous to pay the people who gave you that trouble back the trouble that they gave you. That's righteous. Right? So if that's righteous, 
How am I going to be a good, obedient slave when paying people back for giving me hell is a righteous thing? These are the things that they omitted out of the scriptures. These are the things they never read. And that's why he's not reading them, right? But this is in the scriptures. And if you read it and open it for yourself, you see these things and realize that what they did was misuse the tool. With that, I give all praise to Yahweh Hashem Yahweh Right. All right. Powerful. Brother Sanchez, time will start when you start. Um, rebuttal. Who benefits more from the Bible, blacks or whites, my brother? It's on you. All right, so he contradicted himself because he said that God said save yourselves, but if you listen to what Hebrews be teaching on them street corners, they be saying they can't put the foot on the white man neck and put him in chains until your Yahweh shot come back. That's when they kingdom gonna be built. So they teaching that they waiting on their kingdom to come, but yet he's saying the Bible also saying to save your damn self. The white man ain't waiting on his kingdom to come. He building it right now. But that's what they doing. That's why that's a big uh, hip hypocrisy right there. He said blacks could have basically enslaved whites with the Bible, but we didn't give white people the Bible. They gave it to us. And furthermore, I read the scriptures that is, I read the particular scriptures that the slave master used to develop the psychology of manifest destiny. In other words, I was pointing out scriptures that the white man used to enslave me not the ones that may have inspired some slaves to break free. Think about how silly that is, right? The Bible inspired us to break free from slavery, but it inspired the slave master to create the slave. Think about that shit. So the Bible only gonna inspire you to break away after you didn't got caught and became a slave, but it inspired them to build a whole empire off your back. So you still benefiting less right there. Now, let me get into something else, right? Colossians chapter four, verse one, masters provide your slaves with what is right and fair because you know that you also have a master in heaven. We got to realize the angels in heaven are God's servants and they don't just sit around all day. Them angels are busy carrying out the orders of God. The slave masters run their kingdoms the same way. And that's what we just read. Nature didn't create slaves. Just like the biblical God created the angels, which are the servants in his kingdom, the slave master created the slave that served in his, in his kingdom. The slave's overseer create the very psychosis that maintains the slave and makes him willfully self-perpetuate his own slavery, just like the angel was created by God to serve only. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 7. If someone is caught kidnapping a fellow Israelite and treating or selling them as a slave, a kidnapper must die. You must purge the evil from among you. Listen, he think that's talking about us and they're talking about the, the problems that the slave master had amongst each other. Different slave masters were stealing slaves from each other. And they were saying, we can't be stealing from each other, man. And we stealing from each other. The punishment is death. That ain't having nothing to do with the slave. The scripture proves that the biblical God clearly has crafted a different set of guidelines for the slave masters to follow than the slaves. And that the difference benefit the slave master more than the slave. Being that the slave is told in Matthew chapter 5, verse 40, if any man will sue thee at law, take away thy coat. Excuse me, it said, if any man will sue thee at law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. While the slave masters are told, if someone kidnap your slave, kill him. So the same God that tells the slave masters to retaliate when something is stolen from them is telling the slave to hand over additional possessions to the thief when someone is stealing from them. Now, who does this type of indoctrination benefit the most? I don't even have to say that. We smarter than that, people. Like I said earlier, this type of indoctrination is why the generational wealth gap continues to widen exponentially and why more take and, and why the more they take from us, the more we give them. Think about that scripture. We created and indoctrinated to be more of a benefit to our overseers more than ourselves. And uh, scriptures like that prove what I'm saying. Now check this out, Leviticus chapter 25, verses 44 through 46. Your male and female slaves are to come from the nations around you. From them, you may buy slaves. You may also buy some of the temporary residents living among you and members of their clans born in your country, and they will become your property. Uh, you can bequeath them to your children as inherited property. 
I'm going to read that again. Verse 46, you can bequeath them to your children as inherited property and can make them slaves for life. But you, you must not rule over your fellow Israelites ruthlessly. He's identifying himself as the slave master. When if you read this scripture, we've been passed on to the children of our slave master for generations as their property. And, 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 it, and it, there's no way you can identify with the Israelites here when you read this in context. So what we just read says a mouthful. Verse 46 in particular explains who owned you from the time you came out of the womb. You still a slave purchase property and your social security number is just the barcode associated with the product. Now let's move on. See, I'd also like to point out that according to his own paradigm, the white man is a beast and his oppressor. In his Bible, the beast was said to have been given permission by his God to rule over the earth and the children of the earth for an indefinite amount of time. So it seems kind of foolish for him to pray to his God to free him from his oppressor when it's the same God that appointed his oppressor over him in the first place. Now, Leviticus chapter 12, verse 47 through 48, the servant who knows the master will and does not get ready or does not do what the master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving of punishment will be beaten with a few blows. This type of indoctrination gives the oppressor the green light to inflict his will upon the slave by way of using physical force. The oppressor clearly benefits from that more than the slave that's being oppressed, especially when the slave is indoctrinated by that same God to take his punishment with pride and to glorify his own oppression. All of this is proven in scriptures like Titus chapter 2, verse 9 through 10, which reads, teach slaves to be subject to their masters and everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about our Savior attractive. And in chapter 1 Timothy chapter 6, 1 through 2, says all who are under the yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of respect so that in God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. In other words, all of what we just read is basically saying that since the angels, which were created by God to be God's servants in heaven, are obedient to the will of the God in heaven, then the slaves, which were created by the slave master to be the servants of the slave master's kingdom, must likewise be obedient to the will of their earthly masters, as above, so below. And the reason it must happen is way so that God's name and their teaching may not be slandered, just like we read. Let, let me see how much time I got. How much time I got? Two minutes? Okay, let me get a little bit more of this then. Uh, so this is the concept of let thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Just like the God of heaven have servants called angels on earth, they consider themselves gods on earth with servants and slaves. Like I said, as above, so below. This is the concept of manifest destiny, brothers and sisters. The angels and the slaves have something in common. They're both chosen to serve their masters. And the concept of being chosen is the very thing that makes the servant feel proud of his service. This ensures that the slave has more pride than progression. And this is why to this day we take pride in our struggles just like the slaves on the plantations looked at the scars on their backs from the master's whip as stripes of experience or military chevrons or teardrops under a gang member's eye. The Bible is why the slave glorifies his own oppression and struggle and why the slave master's glory lies in his kingdom. I'm going to say it again. The Bible is why we glorify being slaves and struggling, but the slave master only glorify his kingdom which is dependent upon a slave's proud and willful service. So this is why we read in, in, in Titus chapter, sec, uh, chapter 2, verse 9 through 10, to teach the slaves to be subject to their masters and everything to try to please them. I know I'm pressing for time right now. I guess I'll say the rest of this uh, actually for the ending argument. Oh, I, actually, I can squeeze it in in a minute. Uh, real quick, to be servants of their... They, they made the struggle attractive to us, brothers and sisters, is what I'm telling you. Don't y'all find it strange that our attraction or fascination to the angels in heaven is based upon the fact that they were the chosen servants of God 
And likewise, our attraction or fascination to our lineage of slavery on earth is because we identify the chosen people of God as those in bondage on earth. In other words, the angels or servants in heaven are chosen by their overseer to be the servants of their overseer and slaves. The servants on earth are chosen by the overseer to be the servants of their earthly overseers. And, and what do the angels and slaves have in common? They both take pride in their service to their lords. So the politics of heaven is literally what created the doctrine of manifest destiny on earth. How many, how much time I got saw real quick? It's right there. Look on the screen. You can't oh, see I ain't it. I ain't, okay, that, that's cool. I'll say the rest. All right, Gorilla, you all right? Gorilla, you sleeping over there? You all right, brother? I'm all right, brother. All right, man. We we just completed the first round. We're going to jump right into the second round. And um, I like this topic. This topic coming up, I like this. I know this is going to be fire right here. You got 10 minutes, Gorilla, in this, in this round. Is the Bible really prophecy or just good planning? Damn, I like I like that topic right there. Is the Bible really prophecy or just good planning? Time will start when you start, brother. All right, beautiful. Again, I'm going to give all praise, honor, and glory to the Most High God, Yahweh, and I'm going to do so in the name of His only begotten Son, Yahweh Shai. Like I said in the beginning, um, and I'm going to keep saying, proof is in the pudding. I'm going to keep presenting the proof, the facts, and the data, um, and let's see if he keeps ignoring the proof, the facts, and the data. Uh, so let's go. So here's the question. Prophecy, we got three P words here. Prophecy, predict, and plan, right? Because the word prophecy is defined as a prediction. A prediction means to say or estimate that a specific thing will happen in the future or will be a consequence of something. A plan is to decide on and arrange in advance, right? So let's give a simple example to judge suppose it to, right? Compare and contrast. Predicting who will win the Super Bowl and planning who will win the Super Bowl are two drastically different things. If for whatever reason, be it, I feel as if a particular team will win it all, be it research, a hunch, a dream, some unexplainable divine feeling, or for whatever reason you predicted it, time will tell as to whether or not the prediction was accurate, right? But planning something is having the power and the ability to orchestrate the events. And in the case of the prophecies in the Bible in question are major world events. You're going to have to rationalize how these prophets, who are typically of the poor population of an often trampled upon people from the Levant, have the abilities to orchestrate the fall of some of the greatest empires to ever exist, orchestrate some of the most historical battles ever, and they were part of these plans centuries and even millennia before they actually took place. Divine inspiration, as unlikely as one may think it is, is still more likely than that. Let's examine. First point, we're going to go to Zechariah 9 and read 3 to 5. And Zechariah, according to scholars, lived circa 520 BCE, right? So let's read part of his prophecy. And Tyrus did build herself a stronghold and heaped up silver as the dust and fine gold as the mire of the streets. Behold, the Lord will cast her out. He will smite her power in the sea. And she, Tyrus, shall be devoured with fire. Ashkelon shall see it in fear. Gaza also shall see it and be very sor sorrowful. And Ekron, for her expectation shall be ashamed. And the king shall perish from Gaza and Ashkelon shall not be inhabited. So I have two points here underlined. She shall, who is the she Tyree, shall be devoured with fire, that city, and the king shall perish from Gaza, right? So let's go into the history now, right? <laughs> she shall be devoured with fire. Historian Diodorus Seculus records in a Biblio Bibliotheca Historica that in 332 BCE, which is almost 200 years after the life of Zechariah, during the siege of Tyre, Alexander killed between 6,000 and 8,000 Tyrian men, crucified 2,000, sold in between 13 and 30,000 into slavery. He threw the rest of the city's weapons into the sea and set the remainder of the city on fire. 200 years before this happened, the prophet Zechariah said, that city shall be devoured by fire. 200 years later, here comes Alexander. He devours the city with fire, right? Let's see what happened with Gaza. The king shall perish from Gaza, as the prophet says. Roman historian Quintus Curtius Rufus 
records in history of the wars of Alexander that in 332 BCE, again, 200 years after the prophecy, after refusing to surrender the ruler of Gaza, Battis was killed by Alexander in imitation of Achilles' treatment of Hector. A rope was forced through his ankles and he was dragged to his death beneath the city walls, right? So we had the prophecy in Zechariah, again, 200 years before, but this is way before Alexander was born, before even his pops is born. And he is prophesying that somebody's gonna come burn Tyree down and then go to Gaza and kill the king. And Alexander did both of those things, right? So now, so the prophet Zechariah, who lived almost 200 years before these events, which was a series of battles, a part of Alexander the Great's campaign through the Levant, somehow is a part of planning it. Why? Alexander's four succeeding generals put his people through some of the worst hell on record during the Hellenistic period. Why would the same Israelites plan to put these same people in power? These are the questions that we have to ask if it's just good planning. Who planned it? Why did they plan it? When did they plan it? How did they plan it? If you don't have viable answers to these questions, you can't even debate this topic. If you can't explain to me how Zechariah is a part of this sinister plot for Alexander to burn down Tyree and go to Gaza and kill somebody, if you don't have, and, and when I say you don't have the answers, I need, I need proof. I need sources that these people were a part of a plan to do these things. This is not, no, somebody didn't write this in 2020. There's fragmented and ancient artifacts of these things that go way, that go well over 2,000 years ago, right? I need to know how these people who wrote these things, and we have to remember that Israel was a relatively insignificant people during these time periods, how they were a part of these great plans to put guys like Alexander the Great in power. I need to see this. I, I, I can't just have you say it or you use some rhetoric to try to play a trick on people's mind that it makes sense. No, I need you to provide facts. Because all I provided was data. That's what I'm about. Data. The proof is in the pudding. I need pudding to prove to me that there was a sinister plan that the authors of this Bible was in on. And if you don't have it, brother, you, again, cannot even debate the topic. Let's keep going. Right? Let's go to another prophecy. How much time I got, Sop? Cool, cool. Perfect. All right. So we're going to go into uh, Second Ezra now, 15, 28 to 30. Behold, a horrible vision and the appearance thereof from the east, where the nations of the dragons of Arabia shall come out with many chariots and the multitude of them shall be carried as the wind upon the earth that all they which hear them may fear and tremble. Also the Carmanians raging in wrath shall go forth as the wild boars of the wood and with great power shall they come and join battle with them and shall waste a portion of the land of the Assyrians. So I have certain key points here underlined. Then firstly, the nations of the dragons of Arabia who are the dragons, the nations now, not dr actual dragons, this is the nations of the dragons, the Arabs, the Arabians. Then I have the Carmanians underlined, as the wild boars underlined, and wasting a portion of the land of the Assyrians underlined. So we're gonna go into all of these topics, right? To understand who the Carmanians are. Carmania is a historical region that approximately corresponds to the modern province of Kerman and was the province of the Achmed, Seleucid, Arsid, and uh, uh, S Sassanian Empire, the region bordered Persia in the West. This is the Encyclopedia Iranica. So this is a part of Persia that was the capital of the Sassanian army, which were Persians, right? So now, as the wild boars, what is the wild boars talking about? Warez, meaning boar, which is the epitome of victory in Persian mythology, boar heads on caps crown the heads of the princes. So these people, the nobles of these people will walk around with boar heads. This is why the prophet is talking about the wild boars. Boar figures are widespread as uh, sanitary art, uh, appearing in everything from textiles to stucco and the silver ornaments, coins, and stellars, right? As via documents of the history of the early Islamic world. Going forward now, let's take a look at verse 30 again. The, Car the Carmanians will come out of the forest in a fierce rage like wild beasts advancing in full strength to attack the dragons with their tusks, right? So they're going to fight the Arabs with their tusks. Why are they fighting with their tusks? Let's look at the decline and fall of the Sassanian Empire. The Persians' army had a few initial successes. War elephants temporarily stopped the Arab army. So they used elephants to stop the Arabs. What did the Bible say? That with their tusks, they would advance against the dragons of Arabia. With their tusks. What do war elephants have, brother? They have tusks. And here's the thing about this, because I know my time's running low and I, there's more on this prophecy. But here's the thing about this. Scholars say that Ezra lived in the 5th century BCE. What we're reading about happened in the 7th century AD. So you're telling me that Ezra 
from the fifth century BCE was a part of this plan, was a planner, a good planner to plan something that was going to happen a thousand years later in Arabia. I, I, I'm really going to need you to substantiate that, to give me any shred of tangible relative evidence that, that insinuates that these people were a part of these plans to make these things happen, right? Let's keep going. So like I said, with their tests, I went into, okay, boom. Just to understand about Assyria, this is, um, uh, Asoristan was the name of the Sanusian province of Mesopotamia. So we know Mesopotamia is the land of ancient Assyria, transliterated into their language, they called it Asoristan. Just so y'all understand when it said waste a portion of the land of Assyria, that's what it's talking about because that is the area in which this war was waged. I'm gonna pick back up on it, Salakia, when, um, in, the, in, in the next round because it's a little bit more on this particular prophecy that has to be going into. But as y'all are seeing, I'm going into, this is not up for interpretation. You don't have to believe any particular group of people are the Israelites. We're literally reading about prophecy in the Bible that is very clearly describing historical events happening long before they happen. We're going point for point and demonstrating they're happening. Now you need to go point for point and demonstrate to me how the people who gave these prophecies were somehow involved in the planning of all of these things that happened centuries and again, even millennia after they were dead. With that, all praise you. How about Shemia Rashad? That's my time. All right. All right, man. Powerful, powerful. Um, brother Sanchez, it's on you, my brother. It's on you. The time will start when you start. Is the Bible really prophecy or just good planning? It's on you, Brother Sanchez. Shout out to the great Chief Alazar. Brother, you're going to have to make this a little bit harder for me now. This, this is what I'm going to say here, right? Everything you just did was just what I thought you was going to do. And here's the problem, Sonetta. If you work at the Honda plant, you show up for work every day just to do your job and go home. But the dude who owned that Honda plant, his job is to think about the future of his enterprise. He can't think day to day like the little slave employees. He got to get up every day and think about the stocks in the future, the resources that he's going to be getting to build his product. Where are they going to come from when they run out from this nation? I'm going to have to go barter with these people. These people are passing down their enterprises to their children, to their children's children, and they're planning it out in advance. He think they live day for day like us, so he can't understand why I say the Bible is, is planning and not prophecy, because the average black person too busy trying to live day for day. We don't plan, the average person ain't planning 10 years into the future, all right? But the average billionaire, is building their future today. Listen, my brother Hebrew, the future ain't built in the future. <laughs> the future is built today, brother. And if someone know the plans and the building uh, agendas that we're gonna carry out for the next, like some of these companies got their plans laid out for the next 200 years after they die, they telling you what they want their children to do. And the child in the wheel have to abide by that if he's going to run that as business or they'll have someone else do it, that this is the way I want the company to go into the future. That will is the will of God. In the Bible, they're carrying out the will of their forefathers. This is what you don't realize. So I'm not going to really even need uh, 10 minutes for this. I'm not going to use the whole 10 minutes just to show you how confident I am that we got smart people in the chat that understand exactly what I'm saying. And I'm just going to be cocky like that. You know what I'm saying? So just think about what I'm saying, right? Uh, basically, we can't fathom how one can plan that far into the future, Sonetta. So it seems like prophecy to a people who struggle just to plan day for day. You know what I mean? So when you understand that everything in the Bible was carefully planned and it was passed on from generation to generation to follow that plan all the way up to the day. If I know the plan, it's easy for me to seem like a prophet. If you work at the Honda plant and you don't know the company's plan for the next hundred years and 10 years from now, they're gonna come out with a flying car and I show up for work because I peeked into the book 
I can be like, listen, man, 10 years from now, we're going to have a flying Honda Accord. People are going to laugh at me. But when 10 years come, they're going to be like, yo, this brother's a prophet. No, I'm not. I just knew they plans. I just knew they plans. Just if we know that the governments of the world are hundreds of years ahead of, ahead of us in the technology. The technology you're getting today is shit they've been fucking with and perfected years ago. They're already building the technology for the future right now. You know what I'm saying? In other words, when they came out with the Nintendo, they already had the Xbox and PlayStation being researched in. You see what I'm saying? So I'm going to just stop right there, man, just to save some time. We ain't, this don't even take that much time. This is light work. You know what? I'm giving him six minutes. He can have my six minutes, so That's how confident I am. I'm enjoying my coffee. He can have them because all he gonna do is read scripture, Sarnetta. Go ahead, say, Gorilla oh, Hebrew. This was he saying, giving you time. I'm right. I'm giving you this time plus your time. Perfect, perfect. Thank you, brother. So as I said, this is why I said what I said. I said. It's not, you're not gonna have an adequate argument if you just come with this rhetorical stuff, brother. You can't tell me and liken this whole situation unto a Honda plant owner, right? Here's why. Prove to me that such a Honda plant owner exists. Prove to me that they had these plans. If there was a book with the plans in it that somebody peeked in and then spoiled, where's the book with the plans in it? Who are these people? Explain to me how the Israelite, the prophet of Israel, let's say he's under the, he's just a day-to-day -day and he's under the rulership of Israel, right? Okay. Where does Israel benefit in putting Greeks over them? Where does Israel benefit in the Arabs rising up a thousand years later and conquering a great portion of the world? That's not benefit. How does that benefit them? How is their plans to be conquered and to be subjugated? That doesn't even make sense. I'm going to go through just a few notes I took over the course of him spewing this madness. Like I knew he was going to do. How much data have I produced to everybody out there? How much data has this brother produced? He's just saying stuff, right? So now, uh... Boom. Uh, I, exactly. I just need you to prove. You can't just tell me that such a plan exists. It's funny. A sister came by our camp the other day and she said, I got something for, to tell y'all brothers that, that Africa is California and New York is really Rome and we've been tricked. We've been bamboozled. And she said, the Jordan River is really the Mississippi. And I said, sister, how is the Jordan River the Mississippi? And she just looked at me and said, because the Jordan River is the Mississippi. Right. This is the exact same thing you're doing. You're telling me that these people were a part of the plan just because there was a plan. Brother, I just need one shred of evidence that even semi suggests there was a plan. If you are just talking, you actually don't think that anybody in the chat is intelligent that believes you. You actually are insulting the intelligence of every black person that's going to watch this because you think they're stupid enough to believe something just because you said it. You've not produced a shred of proof. But I got to believe it just because you said that, yeah, there was a plan and he just a plant worker. He peeked in the book and he blew the whistle on the plant. Where is the where is the plan? Where is the book with the plans? in? Where is the schematics at, brother? You can't just assert you already forfeited your time, brother. It's too bad. It's too late. You forfeited your time. Right. You should have actually utilized your time to produce proof of any of the points you have. But the thing is, you could not because such proof does not exist. You just sit in your room and think about stuff and think it sounds good and spew it. And to be quite honest, people of lower intelligence eat it up. A lot of our people are mesmerized by pseudo conspiracy brothers, man. I'm just going to be real. And you just the new one on the scene, brother. That's just what it is. Right. So let me keep going. Right. And, and like I said, failure to address my points is always virtual forfeiture. I knew what he was going to do. He was going to read scripture. Brother, the question is, is the Bible a book of prophecy? I'm supposed to read the scripture. What you're supposed to do is prove that the Bible is a result of good planning. Why aren't you doing that? Why aren't you showing us the schematics and the plans? I'm showing us the prophecy. I'm showing you prophecy in verbatim with history. Why aren't you showing us anything? Why are you just giving us analogies about Honda plants, brother? I know why, because you can't prove or back up anything you're saying. You're just some philosopher, man, who got on YouTube, bro. Let's just be real. So anyway, and, and also, let, let's say, let's say now, let's say that I, I'll take the Greeks out of it, right? Because the Macedonians, they existed contemporarily with Zechariah. 
But the Sanusian Empire and the dragons of Arabia were not in positions of power when Ezra wrote his prophecies, brother. These were empires that didn't exist when Ezra wrote his prophecies. So how is he prophesying about groups of people who did not establish empires before he even died? How did he know that these empires were later going to rise and then they were going to come against each other and the Arabs were going to come out with a religion called Islam and they were going to start taking stuff over? How did he know about that a thousand years before it happened? Let's go, let's go back into the prophecy, matter of fact. Because again, like I said, the proof is in the pudding. We ain't going to do like this, brother, and just rely upon rhetoric. We got to get down to business, right? Where I'm at. Boom. Let's keep going, right? So next, uh, next slide. Boom. So let's go to 2 Ezra 15 and 31, because I want to keep going back on this prophecy, because it get more in depth and all praise to you. How about Shimei was shot for it? And then shall the dragons have the upper hand, right? So like we said earlier, I just want to recap, right? So the Persians, like it says here in the history, and it said in the prophecy, the Persian army had a few initial successes, right? Like it says, the Carmonians will come out of the forest in a fierce rage like wild bulls, advancing in full strength to attack with their tusks, right? And they're tearing up Assyria because all this is happening in what was anciently identified as the land of Assyria. It wasn't called that at this time, but during Ezra's time, it was Assyria, which is why he's calling it that, right? So going forward, they initially were winning, the Persians or the Sassanids, right? So now if we go here, it says, then shall the dragons, the dragons of Arabia, the Arabians who have this new religion, Islam, that they're conquering the world with, have the upper hand, remembering their nature. And, uh, and if they shall turn themselves, the water brother, and if they shall turn themselves conspiring together in great power to persecute them, right? What is this? This is documented in history. The Persian, this is via the decline. I want to slow it down a little bit because I, I do got time. I want to make sure y'all get these sources because I got sources, I got history, and I'm going to cite them because the proof is in the pudding. This is via the decline and fall of the Sassanian Empire. The Persian army had a few initial successes. War elephants temporarily stopped the Arab army, but when Arab veterans returned from the Syrian fronts, where they had been fighting against Byzantine armies, they taught the Arab army how to deal with these beasts. Thus, war elephants had lost their effectiveness in the battlefield. Like it says, these people. So you mean to tell me that the Honda planner, he knew that this war was going to happen and they was going to come out with the elephants and the Arabs was going to have a hard time, but then the other Arabs is going to come back and teach them how to deal with the war elephants. <laughs> and then they was going to be able to get, oh, the Honda planner, he planned all of this out, right? Come on, bro. Let's be serious, man. And it, 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 it would be one thing if you actually had a piece of evidence that suggested any of that was true. But, but I mean, but come on, bro. Let's keep going, right? So that's what the scriptures say, boom. And like it says, it lost their effectiveness. So this is 2nd Ezra 15 and 31 again, and it says, but the dragons will unite their forces, regain their former strength, and win the victory. They will turn and pursue the wild boars. So it said ultimately that the Arabs will pursue over the Persians who put the wild boars on their head, right? Let's see if that happened. This is being the book called the Afghans. It says the battle of nah uh, Nahavan was fought in 16 and 642 rather, between Arab Muslims and the Sanusid armies. The battle is known to Muslims as the victory of victories. What did the Bible say? That the Arabs would win the victory? What did they call the battle? The victory of victories. See that? Boom. Arab Muslims first attacked the Sanusid territory in 633, right? So it took all the way this nine years because like the Bible said, the Persians would have the upper hand at the first. But eventually what happened? The Arabs would prevail and get the victory. When, uh, when General Khalid Ibn Walid invaded Mesopotamia, uh, the Sanusid pro uh, province of uh, Assyria, which is now uh, Iraq, which was the political and economic center of the Sassanid state, following the transfer to Khalid uh, to the Byzantine front in the Levant, the Muslims eventually lost their holdings to the Sanusid counterattacks. They lost it first. The second invasion began in 636. Said Ibn Aqui Waqaz, uh, when a key victory at the Battle of I'm not even gonna try, El Qasaya led to the permanent end of the Sassanid control of Iran. So they eventually got the upper hand at one and that's via the source Iraq after Muslim conquest. Moving forward. And like it says here, Second Ezra 15 and 33, and from the land of the Assyrians shall the enemy besiege them and consume some of them and in their hosts shall be fear and dread and strife among their kings. So Second Ezra said it's gonna be strife among their kings. Let's see if that happened in history, if that's historically documented. This is via the history of the prophets and kings. The Persians were never again able to unite their forces in such numbers. 
many of the Sassanian nobles were already considering deserting the empire. So you see there's already conflict, there's strife within their empire. Even before the battle commenced, many of the Yazdegerd's military and civilian officials had already abandoned him because of that strife. They left, just like the Bible said, there'd be strife among their kings and there was moving forward. Right, according to Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Britannica, most scholars hold that Ezra lived during the rule of Artaxes I. Artaxerxes I reigned in the fifth century BCE. Every battle we just historically demonstrated that was laid out in prophecy, Ezra wrote, took place a thousand years. Yes, an entire millennium after it was written. I mean, damn, even if he peeked in the book, he peeked that, the book had it written out that far in advance. I understand you said 200 years, but bro, over a thousand? They had that much plans in the damn book and he was able to peek in there and find that out about people who did not have an empire yet? Man, that's far-fetched, bro. Right, Brother Sanchez, we're gonna need you to explain how Ezra was privy to the Arabs' plan, the plan that they didn't execute until he had been dead for over a thousand years. We're gonna need that, brother. I'm gonna keep going though, right? That's Ezekiel 4 and 4 to 6. Lie upon also uh, thy left side and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. According to the number of days that thou shalt lie upon it, thou shalt bear their iniquity. For I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity according to the number of the days, 390 days. So he's saying, listen, lay on your side for 390 days. That's going to represent 390 years. Every day you on your side symbolizes a year that Israel will be going through this punishment. So shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side. Switch over to your right side. And thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah 40 days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. So every day symbolizes a year, right? So, of course, we know that 390 plus 40 is 430. So total, he was bearing the iniquity for 430 days, which symbolized 430 years of punishment. Cool. Now watch this. The transatlantic slave trade started in 1441 when Portugal captured 12 slaves off the coast of West Africa. It came to an end. The last voyage of importation of slaves from Africa to the Americas was in 1867, right? That's 426 years. Oh, what? What you going to say? That ain't exactly 430 years? Of course not. Here's why. Romans 9 and 28. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness because a short work would the Lord make upon the earth. That ain't good enough. I got another witness. Matthew 24 and 22. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's day sake, that those days should be shortened. So he told us two times that the day was going to be cut a little bit short. That's why it was 426 instead of 430. But as we can see, the transatlantic slave trade, the importation of theft of slaves from Africa to Europe to Americas and back, all happened within a 430-year period, brother, just as it said it would. Here's another one, a day for a year. Daniel 9 and 27, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, right? One week consists of seven days, and this prophetic alignment, it's a day for a year. So this is seven years. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. That's the key point. In the middle of the week, the sacrifice and the oblation is caused to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the uh, consummation is determined and shall be poured out upon the desolate. Now, this is a prophecy of the first Jewish Roman war, which took place between 66 AD and 73 AD. Now, if we take seven fingers, right, hold them up, right, which one would be the middle? The one that if we put, if we put it down, there'd be an even amount of fingers on each side, right? So let's do it all together, right? How are we going to get three? We put that, so like we put that down and we got three fingers on each side, right? So that means the fourth finger is the one in the middle, right? 66 plus four is 70, right? So 70 AD is the midst of the week or the middle of that seven years. And coincidentally, in 70 AD, in the siege of Jerusalem, the temple was destroyed and sacrifices and oblations ceased, just as the prophecy said. So you mean to tell me that the Israelites planned to have their own center of worship totally destroyed for them to be scattered? That's madness, right? Madness to think that we plan our own destruction. Well, how does that benefit us? How is that good for the company to have the company's capital totally destroyed? <laughs> That's madness, right? Christ talked about this as well. Jesus said unto her, woman, I believe, uh, believe me, the hour, how much time I got, sir? Cool, cool, I got it. Jesus said unto her, woman, believe me, the hour cometh, now watch this, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain 
nor ye at Jerusalem worship the Father. So the key points are the hour that cometh, and nor ye to worship, or you shouldn't worship at Jerusalem, right? So go to this scripture, 2 Peter 3 and 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Understanding that, if a day in the, in the Lord's eyes is a thousand years, and the day has 24 hours, if we divide a thousand by 24, we get 41.6 repeating which is about the span of years between Christ's early ministry in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed and the Israelites could no longer worship at Jerusalem, just as he told the sister at the well. See that? Yet another problem. So you mean Jesus is a part of this great plot to destroy the temple in which venerates what he worships. Come on, man. That's madness, right? So again, why? Got it. Why would the Israelites plan their own temple to be destroyed along with their city, to be scattered from their homeland, and then to later endure chattel slavery for over four centuries? When did they plan this? How did they plan this? And if by some miracle you can answer these questions, brother, very simple, where's the proof? Don't just give us the rhetoric like you've been, trying to pull the wool over the eyes and play the people like they're dumb. Provide proof. You see me going to historical sources, you see me going to real-time data, about Ben Ami Carter and how believing in the Bible has benefited thousands of black people to repatriate back to Africa and live in communities where they don't kill each other and sell crack to each other. I have proof for all that. You came with rhetoric. Brother, bring the proof. All praise you. How about Shimia Shai? That's my time. I got all right, it. real quick, before I bring on Sanchez family, I want to let y'all know real quick that we are just 170 away from reaching 4,000 family. Let's get that before this is over. All right, we got at least 2,000 people in the building. We should be able to make this happen, man. We, we 170 away from reaching our goal of 4,000 for today. All right, so let's make that happen. All right, Brother Sanchez. Yeah. Um, you gave away some time. I hope you don't do that again on this one. You got no. 10 minutes to rebuttal. Oh. You got 10 minutes to rebuttal this one, then we move into the next round. It's on um, my brother, the time will start when you start. I think what he did was exercise the fact that the example I made of the hunger plant and planning went over his head. He showed everyone that he lacks comprehension. And uh, he is really mind boggling to me the questions that he asked. Did the Israelites plan their own temple to be destroyed? Did the Israelites plan their own slavery. This shows you how ignorant he is because no, the Israelites didn't plan it, dude. Their enemy did. That's, that's my argument, bro. What are you talking about? The Israelites, why would they plan their own? That's the argument I'm not making. Their enemy planned that. And that's the argument I'm making. You talking about the Bible inspire people to repatriate back to Africa, why didn't they go to Jerusalem, Israel? The Bible told them to come up out of Egypt. What do you mean? That's a contradiction right there. This is easy, Sarnetta. And you know what's so crazy about it? I want to touch on something else. The Israelites did not prophesy or plan the destruction of themselves, but they foresaw their own end. You know how parents, how the daddy can tell the wife, you know, I don't know, in a couple of more years, we're going to have to do this or do that. It's planned out in the head. It's foresaw in advance. That's the whole reason I brought up the Honda plant. Because in, in with any business, they have a hundred year plan. And the, and the most uh, successful corporations write their plans out even further than that. So you got corporations that write their plans out into future generations. I just read that out of this dude's own Bible, where it said you can bequeath the slaves unto your children in Leviticus chapter 25, where it says you can bequeath them to your children as inherited property and can make them slaves for life, but you must you not rule over your fellow Israelites. So this is what I'm saying right here. Uh, his Bible teaches about planning for the future, but he don't fucking get it. Excuse my language, but he don't get it. You know what I'm saying? His Bible is all about planning for the future when you read scriptures like that, where the, the slave masters were thinking, what about our children? Are they going to be able to have this luxury of having slaves? 
And they and in that book, you see their God tell them, yeah, you can bequeath them onto your children. So we, we're talking about people who plan years into the future. And I keep telling him that they build our future today. He's talking about predicting the fall of governments. Dude, people predicted the fall uh, of the American dollar. And look what's happening now. Don't you know that when you study patterns, bro, you can predict the stock market and be a, a fucking billionaire like most of these people who into the stock is all about studying patterns. Now, me personally, I'm going I'm to make another example, right? I think all of the sports uh, industries are rigged up, but you can very well call a person a prophet who say, yo, next year the Dolphins going to win. And if it happened, I won't think they're a prophet. I would say, man, they know something I don't know. They, they connected with whoever got this crap rigged up because I'm a deeper thinker. I don't believe in no one meditating and saying into the future. And then if that was true, we didn't use these predictions to save our damn self. We never saw the slave master coming and coming up with them ship, uh, ships and them whips. I wish we had a Bible to make that prediction. I wish somebody would have told us you was going to be uprooted. If we had the Bible and everything we going through is still allowed to take place, but we can see the future in the Bible, that show you that it ain't prophecy. We're the victims of someone's sinister plan. Now, let me keep on move, moving on forward. This is so damn easy. I'm, not, I'm just not going to need 10 minutes, but it's light work. I'm going to bless him today with extra time. Check this out, man. Matter of fact, I ain't going to make it easy for him. Uh, here's what I'm going to say to my next argument as well. The reason I brought up the Honda plant is because most corporations don't start a, a business and plan day for day like a worker. They have their business plans written out for their son's sons, their children's children. To regular people who ain't hit with that kind of planning, it's translated as prophecy to you. So the thing about prophecy is the a synonym for prophecy is to foresee something. Look how many people foresaw the fall of the American dollar and the rise of China. People was talking about China going to be a, uh, in a position with America in debt years ago, decades ago. I don't think they're prophets. I think they're people who study the patterns of government, people who study history and see that there is a pattern with the rise and fall of governments. You would say they making predictions. They're able to foresee the thing. See, with that kind of logic, he'll think I'm a prophet when I tell him the sun gonna shine in the morning. Oh, it really shine. Bro, it shine every morning. History repeats itself, dude. History repeats itself. And once you get a, a your, once you get a grasp on a repetition of it, it's easy, easy to foresee what's going to happen. Ain't nothing new under the sun. If I tell you in the future people are going to be having sex, making babies, I'm not a prophet. It's happening today. If I tell you in the future there are going to be great wars, it's because it was great wars in the past. It's not a prediction. If I tell you some are going to come around, we know some are coming. If I tell you, hey man, June is coming next month, am I a prophet? I know the way the calendar work. It comes out to this month every year. But to people who don't understand that type of studying patterns, they can never for one be into the stock business because you have to learn to study patterns to do that. And they'll see everything as magical, some miracles, that he said it and it happened. See, when you shallow thinking, everything is a miracle. It's not, it's not that hard, bro. It's not that magical. There's no prophecy involved. It's just that the people who gave you the Bible, they wrote out the plans of their future generations to follow. It's part of that the will of those forefathers of our slave masters is, is, is embedded in a very religious indoctrination of their children. We call it manifest destiny, bro. Manifest destiny are the children of your oppressor manifesting the will of their forefathers, the destiny 
of their lineage. To you, it seemed like prophecy, but to them, they saying, I'm carrying out my forefathers' plans, is what they saying. You see what I'm saying? Now, this brother putting chicken wings and everything on the screen, and, and I don't know exactly, he probably doing that to distract, but that's what that, when you, you know, that's what this work will do to you. And I know it sucks for him that I'm getting the last word on his argument, and I'm not leaving no more time for him to respond because anybody with a brain see what I'm talking about. A day for day planning dude like him, the only thing he can plan is what corner we gonna be on tomorrow to yell at folks, to set our speakers up. While his enemy is planning on what kind of technology we're gonna be using in 25th. Now to him, that's prophetic, shallow minded again. Everything is a miracle to shallow minded people. Y'all notice that, you know, what I'm saying? like they don't understand studying patterns. And, uh, like I said, if you tell this man the sun going to shine in the morning, he'll think you a prophet when he wake up. I'm done. Sarnetta. We can go to the next argument. OK, so um, family, real quick, before we go to the last and final argument, man, um, let me remind you, tomorrow is going down seven o'clock sharp. You already see, we got um, brother uh, Ngozi going up against Zion Lex, man. That's going to be fire. That's going to be powerful. Man. I don't want to miss that. That's going down Wednesday night. And of course, Thursday night, family. Thursday night, we got brother Chief X and brother Jabari. We got Brother Chief X going up against Brother Jabari. Is spirituality helpful or pointless? Because mm. you know a lot of people say, um, I pour out my wine to the to the spirit. They're dealing with the spirit and the power of the ancestors. So I don't know, Chief X. A lot of people deal with the spirituality, brother. He's going against the spirituality. And then Friday, to close it out, you already know, my captain, Captain Tazariak, going up against a pastor, a real pastor who has a church. Same time, I think this will be a little hour later. This will be going on at 8 o'clock our time, all right? Can a woman teach slash lead man to the word of God, according to the Bible. You already know Captain Tazoriak's position and most of the Hebrew Israelite position. No, a woman cannot teach the word of God. That's for men, that's men's job to do, okay? And is the white man the devil according to the Bible? Captain Tazoriak's position is yes. Pastor Bennett is no. So that's gonna be fire too. Y'all don't want to miss this shit. All right, Brother Sanchez. Um, it's on you for this last and final round, my brother. The last and final round is which creation story is more accurate? The Genesis creation story with the God of the Bible or the great mother goddess concept of the cosmos? Uh. That's fire right there. Let's go. The time will start when you start, Brother Sanchez. Okay, let me start off by saying I want to go and make this straight. I'm not no doggone feminist because I think that's probably one of the tactics he's going to use. When we talk about the great mother goddess, we're dealing with symbolism and personification. Um, when we talk about the creation story of the Bible, we're dealing with creationism. When we're talking about the great mother goddess, we're talking about conception. There's a difference between creating and conceiving. Conceiving is dealing with childbirth. And this is why we were all taught that the universe was born. We hear the term, the birth of the universe. That's why I say that's a feminine act. That's a feminine thing. The universe couldn't have been created. It had to be conceived. To say it was created 
you would have to answer the question, where did the biblical God get water from to make the oceans? Where did he get wood from to make the trees? In fact, who created the biblical God? I'm going to answer all these questions, but I'm going to wait to my second rebuttal before I be too deep on it because I don't want to show all of my cards just yet. So I'm going to save some of these questions and I'll answer them later. Um, one thing I want to point out about the biblical God, one of his names is El, E-L, which is the root word of elements, which is the mind of El, the foundational building blocks of creation being earth, water, wind, and fire, extending from source creator. So when we say element, we're talking about the extensions of the Most High, which allowed him to bring forth a physical creation, but there was nothing physical to begin with. That's the problem he's going to have. That's the problem I don't have because I'm talking about a conceived universe, like how an idea is conceived. In other words, what show me the wood that you use to build the trees in your dreams. Show me the water that you use to build the oceans in your dreams. You conceived of a reality in your mind and project your consciousness into a dream state. It's the mind, it's the thought that is foundating all of physical material. So what I'm saying is creation is but a thought and that thought was conceived or born from the great mother. Let me also add that when I say the great mother, I'm not talking about a woman somewhere in space. I'm talking about the seed that seeded this idea called creation. Those waterfalls were something's idea. Those giraffes was the idea of something greater than you. This is intelligence at play. And it wasn't created per se. It was simply conceived. There was nothing to create with. So the, the, crea the, the conception of a cosmos under the mother God has made more sense to me as uh, other than the biblical creation story in Genesis. Um, other things we got to think about is the Bible is no more than 7,000 years old but the earth is much older. Who was there standing up with a pen writing, let there be light? So you see what I'm saying? But we know that all physical things are conceived in the mind, the microphone I'm talking on. Someone had to conceive it before I can touch it. This, 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 the juice I'm drinking, someone had to conceive it first before you can touch it. The lighter had to be invented, conceived in the mind first before it became physical. So likewise, so is the creation. It's simply a conception and it became physical through you and me, which I think all life on earth is the creator trying to experience its own creation, which uh, why I asked the question, what kind of experience are you giving the creator? Because the creator is experience in the creation through you. So when I use the word creator and creation, it's synonymous with conception, conceiving, I don't literally mean creationism, like uh, the Bible is founded upon creationism. So I use that word for lack of better words uh, until you get familiar with what I mean about conception and the birth of a universe, which can only be uh, possible with a, uh, a female entity or deity. Um, so the Dogon teach about a cosmic egg that was conceived, and this is contrary to the creationism in the Bible. Uh, we're taught that the universe was born, right? So think about what I'm saying. You conceive of different things in your mind, and based upon a conception, you're able to manifest that. Um, but the crazy thing about it is, if you were to ask him, where did the creator in the Bible get the materials to create from? He wouldn't know what to tell you. If you also would ask them, where did the God of the Bible come from? I bet you he can't answer that. Who created the creator is what I want him to answer. I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in that because I can answer these questions. I'm not going to do it yet because he may try to steal my answer and use it for himself, right? So I ain't going to show my whole hand yet. Now, uh, I'm pretty much done, but I'm not going to leave him no more time. So since I got extra time, I can go back and, and, and finish 
uh, arguments, right? That I in the first first arguments, right? Okay, cool. Thank you, Sonetta. All right, so I can go back to some of them first arguments that I didn't finish since I pretty much I'm gonna let him take over that third one about the creation, and I'll go back further into that when he's done. But I wanted to skip around. I'm glad I was able to save time to revisit some of them previous arguments. Um, we'll associate, I want y'all to think about some. One of the arguments was who does the Bible benefit the most for us believing it? Well, check this out, right? What perpetuates slavery is the fact that subconsciously we were indoctrinated to see our struggle as attractive. And who indoctrinated us with that? Titus chapter 2, verse 9 through 10. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything and try to please them, not to talk back to them, not to steal from them, but to show that they can fully be trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about our God, Savior, attractive. Why did they want to make that attractive to us? I, I, I'm reading it again. We were indoctrinated to see our struggle as attractive so much so that we identify with it. We've made struggle a part of our culture, meaning that is now an action used to identify our people. For example, like how the action of martial arts is used mostly to identify Asian culture or how uh, the act of skiing may be used to normally identify Europeans. The act of struggling is the most general action used to identify black culture, which is why we have terms like struggle culture. So that exists within our social environment for a reason. This is also why we subconsciously feel that Black people who grew up outside of the typical Black struggle can't really identify or fully connect with the culture, similar to Carton on Fresh Prince, you know? So we associate wealth itself to whiteness, which is the reason why the Fresh Prince came from the struggle in Philly, but he had the most soul or the most connection with the culture. He got the most women and et cetera versus Carlton who grew up rich and was totally connected to European culture, you know? So both Carlton and the Fresh Prince are black men, but what made them identify with two totally different cultures was the fact that one struggled and one didn't. So when you think about that, the only two cultures really exist is rich and poor. Subconsciously, this is the same programming that makes our struggle attractive because no one wants to be a square like Carlton, right? Everybody want to be cool like Fresh Prince. And the trade-off is that we begin to associate the struggle itself as cool. This is well-thought-out programming, people. That's what I want to bounce to, prophecy versus planning. They planned it to be this way. We just read it to make it attractive in Titus, in the book of Titus. This is the same programming that makes our struggle attractive because no one wants to be a square. Everyone want to be cool like, you know, per se, Fresh Prince. So, when slaves are conditioned to glorify their own servitude and see their struggle as attractive, who does it benefit the most, the slave or the master? All right, I'm going to uh, go back to what I was saying earlier about the creation and the conception, just to reiterate with this last minute. What he must do when he get the mic, y'all, is tell us where did the God or the Bible come from? You know what he's going to say? He's going to say God or the Bible created himself. And I'm going to say, nigga, that makes me a prophet according to you, because I just predicted what the fuck you was going to say. Excuse my language, y'all. Uh, but this, no disrespect to my brother, uh, Gorilla Hebrew, it's, it's just me just, you know, giving you a little passion with it. That's the main thing I want to know. Where did the God of the Bible get the material from to create with in the first place? And where did the God of the Bible come from? On that last question, he's going to say that God of the Bible created himself. Now, I'll let you guys know where I stand as far as who created the great mother God as a who. And, and you know, I'm not going to be unfair. I'm going to hold him to the same. I'm going to hold myself to the same questions that I'm holding him to. And I answer those in my next round. All right, y'all will be able to ask each other questions. Brother Gorilla Hebrew, it's on you, and the rebuttal will only be five minutes in this round here, so we can go to the phone line. So, Brother Gorilla Hebrew, it is on you, my brother. Ten minutes right. to start when you start. Perfect. Want me to read the question again? No, I'm good. I, I, I got okay. It. I got it. So, yeah, so again, 
gonna give all praise and honor glory to you know, Yahweh. Shimmy Yahweh. Just so everybody understand, I show this chicken wing because what this brother has been doing is all his round is winging it, coming off the top of his head, just saying a bunch of stuff, right? Now, it, what's funny is he talked about the struggle. But he made good points. If you see me, I was nodding my head affirmatively because I agree with what he's saying. And this brother, he takes the struggle culture to a whole nother level because he struggled teaching. <laughs> he, you can tell he struggles with actually understanding concepts and doing research. So instead of actually applying himself to doing those things, he just makes up a bunch of stuff that he thinks sounds good and caters to people with, with intellectual disabilities. That's what I'll say, right? I just want to go over a few of the things he said. Number one, he says, I must answer one of his questions. I don't have to do anything because I told you that you must provide sources to back up any and everything you're saying, and you haven't done that in this entire debate. But I got to do what you asked me to do. But here's what's wrong. I wouldn't call you a prophet. I call you a false prophet, brother, because I would never say that God created himself. Existence, the Hebraic concept of God, his name is Yahweh in the Hebrew. Yahweh means he exists. Existence doesn't get created. Existence always has been and always will be. I do not believe a creator needs creating. Why would a creator need creating? And I'm going to also expose how silly this brother is by saying the only way conception can work is if it comes from a mother goddess. Brother, I need you to show me any living being that's ever been conceived without the seed of a man being planted in the womb of a woman in order for conception to take place. I don't know if you're a father. I got three kids. And guess what? When we get to, when you go to that first ultrasound, what does the doctor estimate? The date of conception. When was the date of conception? When I ejaculated in that woman and planted that seed there. So no conception happens without a father, brother. That is impossible. So your own logic and your emphasis on the word conception in this instance of, and your justification for creation making more sense of a mother goddess actually falls on its own head because there is no conceiving without man planting a seed, brother. None. Right. So I'm going to read this scripture just, just just so everybody out there can be aware. This is this is a Colossians two and eight. Right. And let's say you don't believe in the Bible. That's why you ain't got to believe in the Bible. I think we all can agree to this very sound advice right here in the book of Colossians. Right. And it reads this. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. That's all this brother's done has philosophized vain deceit, has provided zero facts. All he's doing is running his mouth. Notice he's purposely going, oh, yeah, I'm going to do that in my next round, right? He's doing that on purpose because I'm going to have less time to respond and debunk what he's saying. So he's going to, just like he did in the last round, throw a bunch of shots knowing that because the way the round set up, I'm not going to be in the position to respond to it. He has several times misrepresented me, what I believe, what I think, et cetera, over the course of this debate in throwing these low blow jabs while he is trying to distract people from the fact that he has absolutely zero facts and data to back anything that he's saying, right? Anyway, I want to go over a couple of things. Um, and, and what's funny is he, sp he spent the majority of his time in that round talking about what well, the Bible this and the Bible that when he has no idea about my concept of the creation, number one, the Bible this and the Bible that, but he doesn't spend his round talking about his belief system. This is the type of things that people have mastered. This goes all the way back to Brother Polite. He masters asking you and talking about everything you believe in, but when it really comes to putting under a microscope what you believe in, you have nothing because you really don't believe in anything. You just talk a lot and try to distract attention to other people away from you, and that's something you probably picked up when you was young. So people wouldn't notice the weakness about you. You constantly was pointing something out about someone else. Brothers with sense and intelligence and who have been around the block identify brothers who do weak tactics like that and understand you're just trying to deflect from your weaknesses, brother. I get it. I understand, right? And, and I got a question. You said the Bible, the Bible don't say the earth is more than 7,000 years old or the Bible only been around for 7,000 years or something like that and we know the earth is much older. Here's the thing. I believe the earth is older than 7,000 years. I want you to provide a source to prove to me that the earth is older than 7,000 years, brother. I don't think you can prove it because you haven't proven anything else. You haven't went to any data, any scientific reference, any historical reference to truly do anything. You're reading the scripture now. Also, I wanna get back to the struggle culture. He mentioned struggle culture and says it comes from Titus too. I want you to find anybody, I want you to go travel, to travel in the annals of the history of blacks in America and show me where Titus two is in direct link with the glorification of a struggle. The best thing we can look at is the glorification of a struggle is black exploitation movies and Curtis Mayfield. And last I checked, they wasn't quoting Titus too, brother. That's when that came out. 
right? We know the Jewish movie companies that were funding a lot of those black exploitation movies that a lot of us love, but did glorify negative aspects of our culture. That's where that started at. It didn't start with the Bible, brother. Nice try, though. Let me look over my notes. Um, and, and then he said, the mother goddess is the creator, but she has a creator. How, how does the creator have a creator, brother? You said that I was going to say that God created himself. I don't believe the creator has a creator, but you just said your creator has a creator. How is your creator a creator if it has a creator? That's just like some of these silly brothers that's in the Kemet and don't understand the Kemetic cosmology when they say Ra is the creator, but wait, then they'll turn around and tell you Ra was created. Well, how is Ra the creator if Ra got a creator? That don't even make no sense, brother. Like many of the things you've said tonight, it is totally lacks any evidence and it makes no sense. I'm gonna show you another lie he said. He said the word element goes back to the word El. The word El, the Hebrew word for God is El and it goes back to element. I mean, listen, I know I know whatever's going on with the squad right now, uh, but man, in my best, I mean, my, my, this, whatever's going on with the squad side, but in my best uh, voice, pseudo, 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 pseudo. Come on, let's go to the etymology of the word element and let's see if it is in, in any relation to the Hebrew word El or any Semitic language for that matter, right? Let's take a look at uh, where I'm at. All right, here, boom, perfect. So this is a uh, element. This is via the etymon line, right? Element. It goes back to the Latin elementum, rudiment, first particle, matter in the most basic form, from the Greek, right? It's Greek and it's Latin. It doesn't go back to Hebrew or any Semitic language. So you literally just made stuff up, just like you made up that it was playing. And I'm gonna tell you what's hilarious, right? What this brother is consistently doing. Hold on, I'm trying to end my share screen, whatever. Um, what this brother is consistently doing. When I'm talking about where did the Israelites plant it, now in the round where he's got the last word and I don't, he goes, I never said the Israelites planted. That's not my argument. You never at any point in this debate, before this debate, made clear what your argument was, that your argument was not that the Israelites didn't plant it. Somebody, their enemy planned it. You now, well, not now, of course, because that's not what the, this is not what this time is talking about. So you could do whatever. But the thing is, you say that when I can't respond to that, right? Here's the thing. That's very, that's very coincidental, brother. And we see your weak tactics in that instance, right? Of course, you're going to say that when I can't respond to it. But the thing is, you've never made that clear. But the thing is, you still didn't go to prove who those enemies were. And when they went in the book and wrote it and made that stuff up and, and uh, made those plans up, right? You have to substantiate those things. So no matter what, you ain't going to get around basically running from producing facts to back any of your claims. I need the history and I need the science. If you don't got sources, brother, it's all right. It's virtual forfeiture, right? But anybody who's got the wool pulled over your eyes, I, I truly feel sorry for you because for a brother to sit up in front of you for rounds and rounds and rounds and not back nothing he said with a historical primary, secondary, or scientific source, and for you to believe that, Man, it's, it ain't no different than that white preacher telling you white Jesus is going to crack the clouds and come save you from slavery, brother. He's no different than a pastor that the white man set up in the churches because all he's doing is talking and trying to make it sound nice. But he is literally giving you absolutely nothing, nothing but a little sermon that to the to the intellectually impaired might sound good, man. With that, I give all praise, honor, and glory to you. How about Shimmy Awashai for a sound mind? Big up to all the people out there, and I yield the rest of my time, sir. How do I unshare my screen? I don't see, like, for whatever reason, I can't see it. Right now. You can't see it? Same way you always been. Oh, 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 the, 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 the screens were blocking. Okay, boom. I'm on. Oh, okay. All right. We all right. Hey, hey, man, this is powerful, man. Uh, Brother Sanchez, you got five minutes in this round to rebuttal. And then Gorilla Hebrew will have five minutes to rebuttal. Then I will have you ask him a question. He asks you a question. We open up the lines, let the people get in. Time will start when you start, brother. He spent most of his time telling y'all what I'm doing as if y'all not watching the damn debate. What he's doing is this, that, this, they, bro. They're gonna see what both of us doing and make their judgment. You wasting time telling them what they should be seeing. You're trying to m m create a false narrative of what I'm doing, like what the news do, and they can tell them what I'm doing versus them saying you just getting swept right now. That's what it is. You use most of your time insulting me 
and talking about I didn't provide sources. Just because the Bible is your source and I'm my own source, that you can't make that claim, brother. I don't have to have a book for my source. People like you don't realize that, like, bro, I am the source. You refer to authors. I write books. It'll be stupid for you to ask the author to refer to their book when they wrote the shit. So I am the source of my information and I don't have a God influencing what the hell I say. Don't hold me to the standards you hold your fellow Israelites because I'm not an Israelite. I can provide sources from wherever I choose or not provide sources because the creator gave me a mind of my own and I can use my own logical thinking, which would be the source of my information. I don't have a book thinking for me like you. So don't expect that from me. That's your problem. First of all, you didn't spend any time telling us about creation and the cosmic conception. You taught us about a man skeeting in a woman, and we know it takes sperm to make a child, but we talking about the earth here, bro. That was all irrelevant, dude. And um, you said there is no conception without a man planting a seed. And when you said that, you debunked your own immaculate conception idea. If it ain't no conception without a man planting a seed, we don't care if you believe it or not. Most of the people that associate with the Bible believe it. I'm just telling you that's an issue for me. Now, he said I misrepresented him, and through jabs, I think he need to quit crying and start teaching, man. Uh, he, he, he's insulting me while playing a victim card. So one thing I want to say is he said prove Earth is over 7,000 years old. I, I only been living 35 years. See, I got enough intellectual integrity to say that it's my belief that the earth is older than 7,000 years. I'm giving you my belief. I don't gotta prove that. That's just something I believe. And when we having a debate about creation is based upon our beliefs. No one can be factual about how it all started. So I think it's just interesting for the people to choose who's given the correct belief or the most accurate belief. Why I think I'm gonna win that is because you didn't spend a lot of time dealing with creation. I don't teach that the mother goddess has a creep. You said, I said that the mother goddess is my creator and she got a creator. You're right. You say your creator don't have a creator, which is stupid that he just popped out of thin air creating shit. That's, that don't make no sense. When I talk about the creation of the mother goddess, she was created by the creation, just like a mother is created by the child. A mother cannot call herself a mother till she give birth. And to the end, she's just a lady. So when, she, when, when the baby, when she have the baby, the baby is actually what makes her a mother. You see what I'm saying? What created the teacher? The students. If the teacher didn't have nobody to teach, she couldn't call herself no teacher. The creation is what created the creator. Because without the creation, you can't have the title of creator. When the creator engaged in the act of creation and the creation was complete, it can now hold that title as a creator. But prior to that, it was not a creator. It didn't create nothing yet. Very simple. You see what I'm saying? So when you ask me what created my creator, the creation. What created my mother? I did. If I wasn't born, she wouldn't be called a mother. She'll just be called a lady. See what I'm saying? But Hebrew Israelites don't think this deep. The Bible don't allow them to use their own understanding. That's why he keep asking me for goddamn sources, because I do something that's so taboo for Christians, which is lean unto my own understanding. His Bible tells him, don't lean into his own understanding. So every, all of his thoughts come outside of him, which means I'm not even debating guerrilla Hebrew today. I'm debating all his damn sources. We should have got them on the show. I am the source. You're debating me and my thoughts and my conclusions today. Not, no, I'm not influenced by outside things other than the research I did to come to my own conclusion, but I don't conclude on another person's conclusion. You might as well let me debate your sources, bro. You misusing the purpose of a source. The source is for you to gather them all and make your own conclusion, not take someone else's conclusion like it's yours. All right. It's on you. You got five minutes, brother. Time will start when you start. Rebuttal. 
Yeah, uh, I'll get all praise you how about Shimi Alshai. Like I said, the, the brother is seriously mis serially misrepresented me. Like I said, he just called me a believer in the damn virgin birth. Like he's done so many other times, he don't even know what I believe in. He spoke about something. I've seen Hebrew Israelites say this on the corner. What are you seeing me saying on the corner? I don't care what you see any brother say. There's Hebrew Israelites that you've seen on the corner that say rape a nine-year-old, right? You see me say that on the corner? All right, then. So you can't just go off of something somebody else said. You need to do the research. What's funny is I just watched your latest video last night, watched a little snippet of it, and to validate one of your points, you quote the Bible, which is funny to me since you're so against the Bible. Here's the thing, though. He said uh, about the sources. He don't need a source, and he tried to fault me because the Bible is my source. I wasn't talking about no biblical sources. I was talking about historical and scientific sources. Here's what you have to understand. I don't know. I know you've been on this platform for a while, but I was the first one to ever go live via video conference with Sonetta seven years ago. I've been doing this a long time. And the name of the game on Sonetta TV is scholarship. It's scholarship. Scholarship means going to historical sources and referencing history that took place, which I did. It's going to science and referencing it. If you have a scientific idea, if you have a conclusion that you personally came to and you allegedly have done research, you need to cite your research because that's called scholarship, brother. That's how this, the name of this game works. Being able to go in and substantiate the things that you're saying that this is documented in history that this occurred. You're telling me that somebody wrote the Bible as a part of a sinister plan is what they were going to do to a group of people. You're saying that, but you have yet to produce, again, one shred of evidence to suggest that. Then he just tried to bamboozle the people by saying, the creation created the creator. Just like I created my mother when I, no, you did not create your mother. Your mother pre-exists you. She earned the title of her mother through your birth. So now what you're saying is that the creator was not a creator until it created. Well, what pre-existed yeah. that creator though? That's the, you didn't answer what pre-existed that creator. When we say who created your creator, we're not asking what made it create things. We're asking where did it come from what is its origin? What is its genesis? So to understand my, just in brief, my understanding of genesis is very simple. Something that has always existed, not something that popped out of thin air because thin air didn't exist because he created thin air. Something that transcends the minuscule thought of you, something that has always created, here's what we have to understand, we're subject to time. A human being, it's very difficult for us to conceptualize anything outside of the confines of time. There is something that exists outside of time. He's called the Ancient of Days in the Bible. His name in the Hebrew is Yahweh, which means he exists, which talks about the fact that he's always been self-existent and self-sustaining. And he began to speak things into existence because he had the ability to. He created spiritual beings. These spiritual beings did, according to the Hebrew, carved out matter. He, they carved out matter, which became the physical world and place that we currently exist in the well. That's my concept of Genesis in brief, just so you understand. Now, I know you ain't never heard no Christians say nothing like that. And I know you never heard no Hebrew Israelites say anything like that. So just so you can understand my aspect and how I understand Genesis, that's how I understand Genesis, right? Now, again, if please, I know you said you were going to go in this round. You was going to go into what you believe in the deeper things of the mother goddess. Please, when you go into it, if I can understand you, your own source. You got your own conclusions, but can you present, please, for the sake of the viewing audience's edification, any shred of scientific evidence that coincides with your ideology of creation? Just any shred of scientific evidence. Any, and, and, and matter of fact, if you ain't got a shred of scientific evidence on that, that's fine. Give me a historical source that validates any of the claims that you've made throughout the duration of this debate. Because if not, again, you've just given a sermon and you've attempted to bamboozle the people no different than the pastor. That's it. It's the same exact thing, brother. At least cite a source. I didn't just expect people to believe what the Bible said. I went to outside, so I went to various historians that were contemporary or nearly contemporary with the events that validated their historical occurrence. This is what we're supposed to do. Again, this is called the house of consciousness. Conscious people do research presented to the, their people for the care of their people, for the benefit and the upliftment and the edification, which means the building of our people. But if you are not presenting scholarship, all you're doing is talking, you're no different than, a, than again, the pastor or any brother that's on a corner that's not doing what we're doing, assembling and actually attempting to give their people something, but you just philosophize brother. That's it. With that, again, all praise you. How about Shimmy Yahweh Shah? And shout out to the people.
All right, man. We got through that. We got through the rounds. I'm gonna say, man, both of you brothers have done a great job. Great job. I'm gonna leave it up to the viewers, to the people that will be watching the show. Let the family know who you feel um one, Gorilla Hebrew, Sanchez, or the family or the people. Brother Sanchez, do you have a question that you would like to ask Gorilla Hebrew? And a statement I would like to make as well. Go ahead, brother. Go ahead. I'll start with the statement. Um, because I forgot to add this. He gave y'all the etymology of element, but he didn't, that's not the way you do etymology. You break the word down. You look up the definition of L, you will see that it is the name of God. And if you do your etymology on mint, you will see it's dealing with the mind, like government, govern the mind. So L represent God, mind represent the mind of God, which everything was created from. And that's what I'm telling you about conception. It starts in the mind. So that proves what I'm saying, even with his Genesis story. But we've been misinterpreting. He also said, I quoted the Bible on, on my channel. I want to say he's right about that. I quote the Bible, the Quran, the Talmud, the newspaper, the source magazine. You see what I'm saying? I can take information from anywhere because if I don't, he going to accuse me of not showing up with sources for my argument. So I'm going to pull from different sources like the Bible or this or that to even build an argument. Meaning if I'm debating a Christian, I'm going to show him the problem I got and quote the scripture. Or I may even uh, use the Bible to show you how the enemy is planning out our future and passing it off as prophecy. So I got to use that which I have on trial. I need the killer in the courtroom if I'm going to convict him. And before I ask this question, when I talked about my mama, me creating my mama, I'm talking about she couldn't call herself a mother without me. Just like a killer can't call itself a killer if he ain't killed nothing. It's the act that gives them the title. And me, is I'm the product of the action. So you see what I'm saying? That's a very simple thing. Birth is what made my mother a, a, a mother. And she was welcome into motherhood with other women who gave birth. But if it wasn't for me, then she wouldn't be able to call herself a mother. That's just very simple. He spent a lot of time telling y'all what I'm doing again instead of just doing him. And he spent this time insulting me and saying shimmy, shimmy, ya, ya, some shit like that. But um, what I would say is that just because you use words like scholarship and all that, that means nothing, bro, because scholarships is just people who are scholastic. Mean you read a lot of books, but books right. don't make you smart. You Let me ask, ask a question. question. That's, that's the question. What, since you calling me a pseudo, where's your scientific evidence of a man walking on water? How do we prove that with science? Brother, until you can give me a scientific source, I won't, I won't answer anything about science. It's question time. Well, well, yeah, this this questions, this question well, time. Well, like Come I on, like, like I said, he he didn't give me any science. I'm not giving him any. I asked him already in in my round to prove to me, and he said he just believed. So how about this? I just believe. Okay, so so let me just then oh, say something on, to the people. Like it, like it. But so, hold so, on, hold on, gorilla. I, I if he just, didn't okay. answer your questions, then that's up to the people. But no, this okay, is the I'm time saying. for question and answers right here. Right. What's this, right. What's, what's this format? What? What's well, the format of this round? Question and answers. Okay, but I'm yeah, just, bro. Is, is there a time limit? Does he just get to ask me questions right now and then? No, I no, to... no, no. You ask him next. You right after you answer his question, he then it's that. your turn to ask no, him I, a question. I, I don't know that because it hasn't been defined, brother. Yes, brother. I, that's the way it is. I, it's going to go down like that. How do I know? So you you ask me a question. I yeah, answer. and then you will be able to ask him a question, and he okay. will have to answer you. Okay. But he ain't gonna answer my question. Go ahead, ask I'm again, brother to... Sanchez. All right, let me ask him. I already he... answered this question. So you have no scientific proof. You just believe it. That that right there. Okay. Well, I ask another one. I asked another you one. You already asked the question. So oh, hold on, hold on, Sanchez. He okay, asked, cool. okay, and he said right. he just believed it. So, uh, brother Gorilla, he asked, he's the pseudo. Then, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead okay. brother. Um, ask your question. Okay, okay, I'm the pseudo. So, anyway, so do you have any evidence, any historical evidence that proves that somebody planned out all of this stuff 
and put it in the Bible? Is there any documents of this conspiracy? Uh, you know what's going to be crazy about this answer, bro? I'm going to go to your Bible to prove this shit. Uh -oh. no, I'm going to go. No, I'm answering this. I'll let me yeah, answer. You got to let, let him answer. answer. You got to let him answer it. See, you can't tell me what sources I can use because you ain't my daddy, bro. I can use All right, your let's Bible. Let's go right to the answer. Let's go to the okay. answer. So, so, so here, here's the thing. Y'all calm down. Y'all did a good debate. Don't let's not mess up this. It's good. It's went good. So all the way. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go to his Bible to show them he don't even pay attention to his damn Bible. Because check this out. I just read in Leviticus chapter 25, verse 44 through 46. In verse 46, it say, you can bequeath them to your children as an inherited property. That right there shows you them planning out over generations, meaning carrying on their succession through the children, passing it on. That's what generational wealth is all about. It's plan beforehand. They're planning for their future generations' wealth. That's why we call it generational wealth. And this manifest destiny is written out in the Bible. That's what they're going by. How can you can't see that? All right, man, I'm through. Uh, Brother Sanchez, ask your last question to Gorilla. Abram. All right, my last question to you is... And then we're going to open up the lines after Gorilla asks you one last one. Because he keep on dealing with telling me I'm pseudo and I ain't presenting no signs. But I asked him a question. He said he ain't got no signs. It's belief. Let's see if he give me some signs now. And if he don't, it's going to prove he the pseudo, like I already proved. So my next question, since we're dealing with so-called signs, where's your scientific proof that a man got up from the dead and walk again? How can we prove that with signs? Because that's what your whole salvation based on. Men do it all the time in hospitals all across the United States of America. People flatline and come back to life. Am I lying? Okay, let me answer your question. If what you saying is the case of Jesus, then it wasn't a miracle, brother. Case closed. Who said it was a miracle? See, there you go. Hey, man. They, 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 hey brother, the Bible you, says it was a miracle. Hold on, brother. Where does the Bible have the word miracle in it, in that instance, about that? You know what? You win. I ain't going to have a semantic war with you on that, bro. No, but, we, but, we all but, thought but, it was a miracle. Like, like, I, like I said, brother, so you've assumed many things about what I believe without ever confirming well, it. And, and well, it's predicated it's, upon your own Christian understanding. But, I, but well, I'm ready, well, to, ask, okay, I'm ready to ask you a question. So when, when is the oldest scroll of the Torah found? I expect you to know that as much uh, more so than me, because I'm not a really, I'm not a Hebrew. But but if you're claiming that somebody wrote in Leviticus about a generational scheme that they plan to execute on a group of people, right? If they plan that out, right, then that should be documented. Then they should have been the authors and responsible for writing the oldest copy of it, right? So that's why I'm asking you. You, in order for you to make that claim, you would have to know when the oldest copy of it was written. I'm just so I'm just I'm asking you when the oldest copy of a book that you said proves that there is a millennial long conspiracy that exists. And I'm just talking just because, you know, because you literally just blowing smoke. <laughs> if, if people want to if, 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 if y'all want to listen to a brother that's sitting in his room and get high and make philosophies up all day. I mean, that's on you. <laughs> that's on you. Like I said, man, conspiracy <laughs> brothers, man, it's crazy. But we can open up the phone lines. Huh? All right. We're going to open up the phone lines and brothers. We're going to end this show off on a good note, on a good spirit. We still going to be brothers, man. We ain't going to be taking personal shots. That's where we got to learn how to be Right, right. But listen, this is where we draw the... Hold on, y'all. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. As of right now, as of right now, we're going to draw the line right there. And we're going to end it on a... Because this is a good debate. Let's not mess it up. You know what I'm saying? This was good. I love it. Hey, so All right, please, family. Let me say one thing to the brother. Chief. Yeah, we're going to open up these phone lines, y'all. Hey, 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 hey uh, my brother, Gorilla Hebrew, I actually watch your uh, videos. And, brother, I'm going to let you know, I do agree with a lot of stuff y'all do and, and how y'all turning a lot of these brothers around. I just don't think the Bible is the ultimate phase of our mental paradigm. But I do want to let you know I respect you, my brother. I don't take this person. I'm just having fun. Yeah, and man, you're a cool, bro you're a cool brother, yeah, you man. Go. You, you know, you know, it's all love. You know, like, you know, just so people don't miss the truth. Now, 
man, come on, man. You know how we are. We we a certain type of people. That's what oh, we yeah. do, man. You know what I mean? That's, that's what we, we do. Never All right. It's Peace and Black Power family. What's your name and where you calling from? Hey, sir. This is the prophet, man. A prophet. Oh, shit. What's happening, man? Do you have a question, my brother? Yeah, I, I, I got a question and I have a comment, if I can make it. Real, real, real yeah, quick. Real quick, because I'm only going to, I'm starting to just give the people 30 seconds for your question oh, so we wow, can get a lot. Yeah, wow. yeah, so we can get a wow. lot because when you listen, listen to the radio, they don't give you that much time. So I'm just trying yeah. to, so I can get through all of this stuff, brother. Ask your yeah, question. Ask your question. Hold on, listen. Ask your question. Hang up and listen to your response, brother. Oh, no, no. I, I said I got a question and a comment. Make your comment brief, brother. Hurry up. Go ahead, brother. I, I will. I will. My comment. My comment is going to be this here, and Brother Gorilla is going to know what I'm talking about, okay? My comment number one, okay? Here's my comment. Barashi, bara, alahayam et, yahashamayam, wayat, hayat, hayat. Brother Gorilla, you understood what I said, right? I take that first word, barashi. I take that first word, barashi. And I break that first word down. Ba. Okay? Ra. Ah. ah. Sha. Ya. Ta. What I just told you is that the Son of God from the house of God is going to give his life by his own hand on the cross. In Paleo Hebrew. Hallelujah. Brother Chan says, Brother Chan says, there is no letter E in Paleo E. All right, what's your question, brother? What's so, your question? My question is going to Chan says, there is no letter E, so there is no L. That That's ain't a, a question. Canaanite God. The question is for Sanchez, prove that the world is flat. All right. Because I know you believe. You know what? You know what? We're not even talking on that topic, but um, if right. but that's do it, his belief. Let me that's ask, a long. Let me hold on, hold on. Listen, that's a long, long. I mean, come on, man, for, brother. I um, I got to get this call. Just prove he can't prove it, sir. So, uh, let me answer him, man. So we can go to the All next right, go call. ahead and listen. Go ahead and listen. I got to get the um next caller. Go ahead and listen. He's gonna answer it. Peace. To the, to the caller on the to the caller on the line for the sake of respecting Sarnetta show. I'm going to stick with the title. I understand the kind of program you run, and I'm going to deal with your biblical stuff that you mentioned earlier. And uh, the thing that I want to say to the Flat Earth thing, if anybody interested in learning about Flat Earth or debate me on it, my email is talktobrosanchez at gmail.com. I want to encourage you to approach us. Uh, there's thousands, millions of your people who subscribe to Flat Earth. And I think instead of insulting them, you should see, you know, what made us come to that conclusion because you got people out here believing in talking snakes, men walking on water, men getting up from the dead. Come on, man. Like, and people don't laugh at that, but they laugh at a person who subscribed to the cosmology of the ancients. The ancient Hebrew cosmos is based upon Flat Earth, not a globe. The globe only exists in Sumer. And by the way, I know that there's no E in Hebrew. I was referring to the Canaanite, the Canaanite terminology of the biblical God. The Canaanites called him El. He was called by many names all over the world. And it's still been an, another name of El is Allah or Allah. But these are things I teach on my channel and I can't really get to in detail with it here because other callers are coming. That's why I give my email. My uh, backup channel is Bro Sanchez Live. I was someone, getting ready to tell you to let the people know that. Yeah, yeah if, they, if they email me right now, I'll crank up a live stream. We can debate. It'll be professional like Saad doing, and we can get some of these arguments, side arguments done over there, and we can keep respect uh, side platform with, with the topic. Okay. Um, Peace and Black Power family, what's your name? Where you calling from? Hey, peace and love. This is Brother Garfield from the Dagger Squad. Uh -oh. I want to say peace and love. Garfield. <laughs> Brother Garfield, what it is? I, I want to say I'm so proud. I'm, I want to say I'm so proud of Gorilla Hebrew tonight, my brother. You did a very good job in putting your 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 message together. But I also want to say to Brother Sanchez, 
in what you understand of the Bible, you did a very good job. Because I, you know what I did? I saw a contrast. I saw a brother that believes in the Bible and a brother that looks at the Bible differently. That's all it is. I'm not going to hate on anybody tonight. I just think it was a beautiful debate. Both of you guys were respectable. Um, I disagree with a couple of things um, Gorilla Hebrew said as far as Second Ezra and the prophecies. But, I mean, if he calls me out, I'll debate him. I'm not calling nobody out. I'm just, <laughs> if, you, if you know this on there, if you know this on there, they don't call me out. So I'm not calling <laughs> no, nobody out no more. What's up, brother? Hey, man, if it was you, I would have went a whole different way, man. You know I would just to my <laughs> opponent. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I want to say, first of all, son, that I'm proud of what you're doing. This, this, you're you, bringing bro. the debates back because I know the Hebrews will be like, oh, y'all just want to debate us and we don't need to debate. But you see, who's debating? You got Captain, you got Gorilla, you got Zion. And I love all them brothers. I love what they bring and it's good energy. So it's good to see Brother Sanchez, a brother I don't agree with a lot, but I love him. That's my bro right there. That's my bro. I could I could listen to Brother Sanchez for hours. Gorilla Hebrew, come on. He got the longest damn live stream from the Hebrew camps in all of America. So, And he's in the street. You know what I'm saying? So shout out to Brother. I'm just glad the guys did what they did. But I want to say this, though. Much love, Garfield. You still there? He cut out. You sound muted. Um... When we're reading the Bible, when it comes to prophecy, we got to understand. You asked um, Sanchez a question. You said, what evidence do you have that they pre-wrote stuff for the future? The book, uh, give me a second. The book of Daniel is considered by scholars to be written after the fact. That's why so many errors are written in Daniel. Daniel says that um, Belshazzar is Nebuchadnezzar's son when it actually was Nabonidus' son because we have the archaeology. Yeah, all right. Because we have the archaeology to back it up. So there's stuff that I could have brought out. I'm not trying to debate Gorilla Hebrew or whatever. If he calls me out, son, I'll come. You know what I'm saying? I'm not calling out no Hebrew. Them days is over. Let them call me out and I'll come to the table because I know what I know what I bring. But I want to say much love and respect to everybody in the audience, the support, the respect. And, 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 and you know what, though, son? There's no disrespect in your chat. There's no disrespect in your chat. Almost 3,000 people. I don't see no disrespect. So, hey, I got to give a shout out to the audience. I learned a lot in the comments. I haven't been running anything. And I'm, I'm learning a lot. I'm learning a lot from the Hebrews Thank and from know. Brother Sanchez. Yeah, yeah, man, enough respect. And big up your, um, your, your text blast, bro. Remember, you got your text blast. Yeah, you yeah, go ahead. About Do that right now. Do that. So anybody who wants to be a part of um, the news and report and the latest news of what Sonnet is doing, you need to text the number 818-818. So that's 818-818, and you're going to text the word Sonnetta. One word, Sonnetta. Mecca's going to put it inside the chat. She yes. got it in the chat yes, now. in the chat right now. 818-818, and text Sonnetta, and then you're added to the text blast list. So if Sonnetta has something new coming out, the Gorilla Hebrew is live next week, you just text everybody out and say, hey, Gorilla Hebrew is live to 5,000 people or whatever, all right? So peace and love to everybody. I love the energy, man. Son it a long live son of the family. Peace and love. Hey, peace, peace. All right, um, let me ask Let me ask a question before I get back to the phone lines. Yeah, I know how I do. I always got to bring some smoke and ask both of my brothers a question. I'm going to ask you this question, Gorilla Hebrew. You said in the debate with um, Brother Sanchez, you said... How do you know something as far as the world is older than 6,000 years? Am I correct? Yes, sir. Well, when I show you this right here, when you look at this and you see this is powerful proof right here that alligators have been on the earth for like 6 million. Some people might say, well, you know what? That's pseudo. That's pseudo. Do you believe this story? Do you believe that alligators been here for damn near six? Six million years. Not a chance in hell. On the earth. I said I million, not a thousand. I believe the world is older than 7,000 years again for the record, but I damn sure don't believe ain't, ain't no six million years. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you don't believe that? Now, you know, the only animal that have not changed its features was the alligator. 
Like damn near every other animal, you had the saber tooth tiger. They changed through the period of the years. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you yeah. had a lot of animals, but, the, but the alligator always remained the same. I want to look into that, man. That's brother, good. yeah, go and look that up. I'll put it up again so that people can go and look it up. So they might say, come on, son, now that's some damn pseudo shit. You done, <laughs> you done did some crazy shit. <laughs> you know, but I, I'm telling you, man, you can look it up. You see what I'm saying? Take a screenshot and do what you do. But yeah, man, that's proof right there. Now, you already answered that. You said you don't believe that. Brother Sanchez. Uh-huh. Let me, you, let me, you, yeah. no, let me, I got to ask you a question now. Brother Sanchez, you were saying something about the Bible that can't be prophecy. You don't agree that the COVID-19 could be a prophecy of the Bible where it states that it's going to be certain things that's coming to the earth, like, like, you know, like a pandemic and stuff like that. I'm surprised Gorilla Hebrew didn't go that route. I'm surprised well, when you, when he was supposed to prove that the Bible is prophecy, I'm surprised he didn't prove it using the COVID-19. So well, what do you say to that? Well, I'm going to just say this. When we read the Bible and, it, and the biblical God is threatening people with disease and he's saying, you better tell them to do what I say or I'm going to strike them with pestilence or plagues. We don't really interpret that as biological warfare because we don't know biological warfare is an ancient warfare tool. They was using that for so many years. So the biblical God, when magically striking people with plagues, it was the people who trying to play God on the earth during that time, creating disease like they do in the day. And when they know they're going to master the uh, art of biological warfare, they can safely say, you know what? In the future, it's going to be so much pestilence and plague on the earth and diseases coming. Uh, you can you can make that prediction if you understand biological warfare and the technology they're researching, where it's going to be at in the future, it's going to be stuff. I'm going to, I'm going to be a prophet. So I watch this. Our children are going to have to worry about worse epidemics than what we were worrying about. Now in the future, you're going to think I'm a prophet for that, but I'm not. I just know the research they're doing in biological warfare. I know the things they're tampering with and the, and the uh, detriment that it's going to cause in the future on a massive scale. Is no magic about this. You know what I'm saying? But but I did want to deal with the thing about the age of the earth, if we can bounce back to that at some point. Oh, all right, yeah, it. we'll get back to that. Peace and Black Power family. What's your name? Where you calling from? Yeah, this is uh, Naya, man. I'm calling out of Tennessee right now. Tomorrow. All right, my brother, ask your question and hang up. Listen to it on the line. Absolutely. I got two questions, one for the brother Sanchez and one for the brother Gorilla. Forgive me, I'm not sure the whole name. Pardon yes, me. Yes. My, my first question pertaining to the brother Gorilla is pertaining to prophecy as, a, as people assert the Bible is. I'm not saying it is or it isn't. But my question is, you did any research into Rome in Greece and how they wrote and rewrote people's prophecy. And, 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 and with that, as it pertains to the Bible, because what we're calling the Septuagint right now, what we're calling the Old Testament, whatever you call that, what we have right now just is not the question, what brother. Just got to ask the question. Oh, yeah, right, right, right. So with, that, so with that being said, is it possible that what we're calling prophecy, because of the time that the Bible was published, as we know it, that these things had already occurred? as we find the Greeks, Greece and Rome as it pertains to how they, um, how they, uh, how they, how they rewrote history. And to the brother Sanchez, you know, respect to you both. I got the question as it pertains to the Bible and as it pertains to the Osirian uh, cults that were coming out of Kemet, do you see anything in the Bible as it pertains to our own ancestors tradition, like the Vudan and the astrology and the numerology. And with that, thank you very much for your time. Um, brother Sarnett, appreciate you, all right? Peace, brother. Thank you. All right, brother Gorilla Hebrew. Yeah, uh, as far as to his point, um, when people ask the blanket statements and, and they talk about when the Bible is published, I'm not dealing with when the Bible is published because we take a look at source documents for all of this. So we're going back over 2,000 years and analyzing that text in the oldest form that we have it, right? But if you want to call into question certain prophecies, you would have to 
uh, individualize each one and take a look at when we have the oldest copies of it, right? Um, and, and that's how you would have to call that into question, but that would have to be looked at book by book individually because we know the Bible, we have it today as one book, but it consists of 80 different books. So like when Garfield called on and he brought up Daniel, we would have had to have a conversation about Daniel. I would have had to go into sources that validate or put Daniel. Some people will, uh, in, some people will say that Daniel is backdated, right? Or, or certain books are backdated. So then we'd have to have a look at the text and see what's backdated and what's not to try to, in an attempt to invalidate the prophecies. But that's something that we have to deal with on a case by case basis, which we're prepared to deal with. Um, which is why I said to Garfield, I know how to, you know, I, I know how to adjust to certain opponents. So, you know, that's all dealing with 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 uh, textual crit criticism and all of that. It, all of that varies when you're dealing with any ancient text. Um, but we're not dealing with 1611 when it was published. Of course, that's when we got English. But we dealing with mm -hmm. decipherment of Greek, Hebrew, Latin, etc. So we don't we read this because all of our people read it. But we can always look at it in its original form and decipher it all the time. So that's if you're going to have that conversation, that's what we have to deal with, not the English. But that's my answer on that. Brother Sanchez. <clears throat> Yeah, he wanted me to make some connections between ancient Budom and uh, the Bible. Yeah, well, he was actually, do you see any connection in the Bible? Yeah, that could take you back to our ancient ancestors or something. Now, to my understanding, and I'm not gonna make it like I'm a Voodoo expert or nothing, but I know that one of the oldest deities in Voodoo culture is called Lekba or Papa Lekba if I'm not mistaken. And uh, I actually think that Papa Lekba is just another form of uh, the Baphomet or either uh, Christ himself. There's something called syncretism and I sync all of these deities together on my channel. I may not have time to deal with it here, but uh, one thing I can say about the Bible and ancient Kemet connection I'll do this real quick and I'm not going to be take a lot of time on this because if people really want to learn, they would, like I said, email me and, and take, bring me on, the, I'll bring them on a platform where I can show them exactly what I'm saying and we can have time to do it. Now, can everybody see my screen share? Yeah. Yeah. Try not to take too long. All right. This will be two minutes. The, I, I come to my realization, and I'm not an expert, I'm just researching, guys, that the Egyptian god Shu is actually the god Yeshua to the Christians. If you look at the sacred geometry of Shu in this image, in between the two thieves, it's the same thing they give us for Christ. If you look at Shu's arms, it's the same sacred geometry of Christ in his art, and they're both surrounded by those thieves. I teach that Shu is Yeshua. I'm showing you that what they call Mount Calvary was actually called Mount Maru and the Egyptian just called it Nut, which is the sacred mountain of the cosmos, the uh, dome, the firmament dome that the Bible speak of. So I'm just giving y'all a sneak peek into an alternate way to interpret your reality. I'm not saying I know everything. These are the things that my paradigm, my research led me to and many others are resonating with it. And I think that I'm open for debate. I'm open for criticism. I want that because if I'm wrong, I want to be corrected on stuff. But I do want to be able to explain to different people in detail how I come to these conclusions. So email me. We can go deeper to all of the callers that's asking questions because Sa got a time limit and we can't teach another lecture and all that, you know, answering the call. So. All right. Peace and Black Power family. What's your name? Where you calling from? Peace, peace. What's up, man? This is Amorpheus. What's up, family? Amorpheus in the building. Yeah. What's up? We hear you. Yeah, this is a powerful bill right here um, that went on um, tonight. Um, I got a question for uh, uh, Gorilla Hebrew. Um, shalom to you, brother. Shalom. Um, uh, my question is uh, uh, um, concerning prophecies, right? Um, what is your thoughts on, pro on prophecies and predictions that are outside of the Bible, say like in other different people or civilizations that many have said has come true, such as uh, Nostradamus. Many people say uh, say that Nostradamus, who is clearly not a Hebrew, uh, prophet, prophecies have come true. Also, you have uh, the, the Hindu people in uh, um, Bhagavad They have many predictions or, or prophecies in this uh, uh, culture 
that many of them say have come true. So I, I'm, I'm just curious, um, what is your thoughts about those, you know, other people who are not, you know, part of the, uh, you know, biblical people? All right. Thank you, Morpheus. That's good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, peace. All right. Peace. Yeah. Uh, sure. Hey, Gorilla. Yeah. So, I mean, as far as that goes, I, I don't have an absolute answer on that because I've never seen any evidence of any of those things coming to pass. I'm, I'm not saying that that emphatically means that it didn't happen or there's no predictions or prophecies that anyone else could have had. I'm not, I'm not saying that, but I personally ain't seen the evidence. So we'd have to examine um, those things with an unbiased mind, which is something I'm willing to do. And then after doing that, I'd be able to adequately answer that question, but I haven't, I mean, the, the closest thing I heard about Notre Dame's prophecy was he said it was two brothers and one was going to fall. And they said that was nine 11. You know what I mean? But I've, that, I've, I've heard that before, but have I really went in Notre Dame's book ready? Exam you know what I mean? No, it, it, people say things, but everything, we just got to put it up to the evidence. Like I was doing showing boom, this verse say this, then look at this aspect of history. You know what I mean? Making that parallel. So, and I, and I made sure to choose prophecies that weren't too mystical or too much of a similar to it said, listen, they said he was going to get burnt. They said he got burnt. They king was going to die. He went in there and killed their king. I wasn't going to go into anything that somebody could say was too much up for interpretation. And sometimes things are, and it's mystical. And then people can try to say, oh yeah, it happened because of this and that. I mean, you know, we, we'd have to look, just like I said, with each particular biblical prophecy, we had to look at everything and analyze what the facts are and what it say before we can make any absolute conclusion about anything. So I'm not telling anybody just to blanket say, Nah, ain't none of Nasha down. I don't know. We ha we'd have to look, you know. So I I can't say because I honestly have not looked into that. All right, peace and black power family. What's your name? Where you calling from? Calling from Cali. Shout out to everybody. Uh, thanks for having me up here. Uh, Shalom Wong to Gorilla Hebrew. Peace to the bro Sanchez. He's my brother. I actually tuned in to I actually tuned in to both of you brothers, and uh, you know, this was a fire bill. Shout out to Sarnetta for bringing this fire bill. Real Please. talk. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, definitely. This was good for the people. Uh, I got a question for Gorilla Hebrew and one for Brother Sanchez. Uh, my question to Gorilla Hebrew is, um, with a lot of uh, the new uh. Uh, finds that they've been finding throughout uh, America that's been like ancient American history and uh, according to some of the writings uh, with the Aztecs uh, is it possibility is there a possibility that uh, maybe that uh, as far as uh, the Israelite culture go that uh, the way that y'all looking at as far as uh, what Israel has might be uh, actually in another uh, direction and uh, to the brother Sanchez, uh, I know he loves to, um, you know, the brother go heavy with uh, the Dogon and the uh, the Newton gig uh, as far as, like, the Egyptian culture. Um, they speak of that, you know, they came to that area and uh, started civilization. I was wondering if the brother uh, have any, uh, any uh, evidence that he ran across that uh, show where uh, the the comedic culture actually, uh, the original pre dynastic uh, actually came from. And uh, that's my question. Thank you. All right, thanks. Let's go. Yeah, uh, I would say um, as far as that goes, people have been attempting to, and I just encountered a sister uh, in the video just came out yesterday. People who are trying to say the sister, uh, and I'm not saying the brother's making as outlandish claims as this, but the sister told me that Jesus was born in Illinois, that New York City is Rome, like I mentioned, and that California is really mm -hmm. Africa. This is what the sister said to me. And this is not America. We're really in Asia. California is Africa. You know, she, you know, she told me some stuff like that. There's people who have been coming with a lot of this stuff. But what we have to understand is, I, I, I'll point you to my lecture series called Viva Yasharala, talking about how the Aztecs and Mayans came up over here and, and built that. Now, there may be some, there are a lot of similarities between the Israelite culture and their cultures. And the reason is because they are, they are Israelites. And they left from over there after they were in, in uh captivity to the Assyrians. While the Assyrians were busy in war, they left up out of that captivity, came over here with the intentions of rebuilding their own kingdom over here in a place where nobody lived. That's why, like Sa always talks about, when they brought the slaves over here, we was already here because we had already came here. That, this don't mean this is where we originated at. You see what I'm saying? I think people um, get lost in that. And even dealing with the Genesis, I recently did a Genesis breakdown, the Genesis 1 and 2, showing you that even Adam's origin 
is in Africa and is actually west of the Nile, right? Because if you just simply follow the narrative, it says that the Adam was placed in Eden. So Adam did not originate in Eden. Adam, Adam was placed in Eden. Eden is the Nile to the Euphrates. The Bible tell you that, right? Because later it calls Assyria, the land between the Nile and Euphrates, Eden, right? So that's what we know where Eden is at. So if he was, it says that he was um, westward of that because he was taken eastward and placed in Eden, what's east of the Nile, so the rest of Africa. So that means that Adam was taken from Africa and put into where he was at. So we can't get around the fact that we originate from over on that side of the world and then we ventured out over here through having our maritime power and being able to navigate because we understood the stars. That's a blessing that we had and you know from the most high and brothers were able to navigate over here. But we originate over back on that side of the world. And I think, I, I don't know why some brothers have said you know, maybe people have, give, you know, have this real anti-African idea, but we can't get away from the fact that we from over there. That That's that's discounting entirely too much history. You know, All so right. that's- All right, Peace and Black okay. Power family, hold what's on. your name? Oh, oh. Yeah, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't- Hold on, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me get um Brother Sanchez. Go ahead, Sanchez. All right, check this out. I'm gonna screen share one more time and I'm gonna yeah. try to be brief as I can just because I know the callers want to get it in. Uh, I'm accessing some right now. Okay, this is this is cool. So let me uh, cut the screen share back on. Hold on, everybody. I'm having some issue. Here we go. Here we go right here. All right. Let me open this up. Um, damn, how did I screen share? Oh, yeah, right here. This is how I did. Okay. So check this out real quick. The brother asked me about the Dogon. Most Christians don't know what I'm going to show you, right? In the Bible, it talk about the dove landing on the cross. That was plagiarized from the Dogon. I'm going to prove it with sacred geometry, right? So when they talk about the dove landing on top of the cross when uh, at Mount Calvary, I'm going to show you exactly where the Christians get that from. And I'm going to show you that the ancients had it before any of them. So if you can see my screen, here's the secret. It. Okay, here's the uh, dove on the cross real quick. This is uh, the Jesus version. If you look at everybody grew up looking at this, right, with the dove landing on the cross. Let me put, let me blow it up for you. There you see the dove on the cross, right? Now look at this image. This is the Mayan cosmos. Right here is a, a bird at the top of a cross landing on the cross. If you look at the name of that bird, it's called a bird of heaven. And it's landing on top of the world tree. The Christians turned that into this plagiarization. Let me show you what the Dogon said, So This is Dogon art right here. I wish you can zoom it in and make it big. This is the Dogon great mother. She's representing the sacred cross of creation. And to the left of her face, you can see a dove landing on the cross right here. I don't know if y'all can see it, the dove landing on the cross. This is where they getting it from, the ancient world, and it's being plagiarized. Here's the original cross with the great mother in the Dogon womb of all world signs. Here is also an image of the great mother, which is the Kananga. The Dogon Kananga is the great mother. Now, what we looking at here, and, I, and I'm going to end it with this, is what a, people was asking me about flat earth and all of that. Well, this is actually the Dogon conception of the cosmos as well. And if you pull up the Dogon cosmology, this is what you'll get right here. They were never talking about Sirius. Even the Vedic had the flat earth in the form of this image here, which is the Naginis. The word Gini is where we get the word genie for Genesis from, Genesis, because these were the uh, deities that the ancestors used to teach about how the ripple effect of life even began. Our earth is a ripple effect. Vibration causes the, the ripple effect, the source vibration from the center, which the Dogon called Ama. And before it was Shu raising up the uh, the dome, it was the great mother. They, when he talk about being born again through Jesus, it's because he's personifying a female position. It We, ha we didn't have those problems when we were talking about the great mother, because you can be born again through a mother. So Jesus on a cross with his arms open with the blood on him is really childbirth. Because when you look at the uterus, that's who, that's the pain that your mama had so you can live. But they gave it to Jesus. They say, 
he went, he went through pain so you can live. When your mama actually did, and they took the symbolism and linked it to Jesus. This is why people will cuss their mama out, but they'll pray to pray to Christ. They All took right. the rap. Right. Okay, right. yeah, go. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. Let okay. me stop you and share. Thank you, brother. Let me bring up. Hey, Sanchez, me and you got to get together where we can go in on, and do a show on your own where you could go in on all this. Man, I can't wait to do it. Okay, next week we got it because I'm lined up with the beat. So next all week right. we're going to get it in. Peace and Black Power family. What's your name? Where you call it from? Peace, peace, brother Lord Abba. What's good, Doc? All right, Lord Abba in the building, just coming fresh off of his debate yesterday. It's What's going on, Lord Abba? Oh, I'm good. I'm good, man. I was just listening in to the debate. Shout out, shout out to the brother. Shout out to brother Gorilla Hebrew. It's long, um, brother. It's so long, so, so long, brother. That brother actually hit me up a few years ago. He seen one of my papers on on the mall bike. Uh, you know, it kind of it kind of ruffled him a little bit. He ain't never seen nothing like that. <laughs> and we start building in the inbox, and we've been cool. We we did a debate on Sarnetta before. That's when. Shanetta was letting dudes come on and jump me <laughs> at that time. But um, I just wanted to just give a quick commentary on the debate, Shanetta, because, you know, and I don't know, Brother Sanchez, like, I'm about the debate, I'm about the information. I don't, I could disagree with the whole doctrine of the Hebrew Israelites, but at the end of the day, a debate is a debate. And we watched the same thing happen with Brother Reggie last night that brother Sanchez did, in my opinion, tonight. Like I said, I don't know the brother. I ain't got nothing against the brother. I'm judging the debate. I thought brother, um, the Hebrew Israelite, won hands down because he stuck to the premise. He showed and proved using not only his Bible, but extraneous sources as well. And I, brother Sanchez, and from my vantage point, and I listened to the whole thing, I didn't hear him provide any rebuttals or any positions to back up his stances. And Brother Reggie did the same thing last night. So I just want to say in closing that I hope that the brothers that's listening to me that will be in the upcoming debate understand how to debate because these are not debates at the end of the day. It's just one person giving a, a teaching lesson on what it is that they believe in, et cetera. Please understand the format of a debate before you come up here and debate. Again, I ain't trying to crap on nobody. I don't know the brother. I'm just judging the debate. Right. All right, so, thank so, you. This, this, this is what I'm going to respond. respond and say, brother, we know Chief Alazar play, uh, paid you well to cake. I have no problem with no one saying that, uh, having their opinion on who they think won a debate, but you just become a damn liar when you say I didn't argue any of the points. So I was up here talking all that time and argued zero of the points. That's called caping too hard, man. You know what I'm saying? That's obvious that you caping. I think I made hella good arguments. I think Gorilla Hebrew used most of his time saying shimmy, shimmy, ya, ya, and telling y'all what the hell I'm doing. Stop comparing me to Reggie. I'm my own dude. Uh, when you make those kind of comparisons, it's disrespectful to Reggie and it's disrespectful to me. It's, it's okay to call in and, and voice your opinion on who you think won, but that ain't what you did. You just called in and straight cake, my nigga, but I'm going to just let you go to the next caller. He didn't even ask a, a question. So, All so right, thank you. Next, thank oh, you. Can good. I just say real quick? Uh, no, 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 let's 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 it, it, let's go to the next one. Let's go to the next one. No, this ain't a debate. This ain't a debate. We already know that's it, brother. All right. Thanks, Lord. Peace, peace, peace. It's love. All right. Um... Y'all keep telling me to slow down the damn chat. I don't know how to do that. You got to you got to do it in the settings. You can't you can't do it while it's live. You like when you uh, like if you go to the settings, uh huh, the advanced options. You can slip, put the chat in slow mode. Oh, okay. So I don't yeah. know how to do that, but if I'll figure it out. Only, like you can only if if you make a comment, you can't comment again for for a minute. Oh, okay. All right, I gotta figure that out then, man. Last call up, man. Let's get this last call up in the building. And then I'm going to let y'all brothers close out. Hello? Peace and black power, man. Hell is low. You a Bible man. Don't you know that? I said that I said that on purpose because you always say that That's stupid right. shit every time. <laughs> Peace and black power, family. We got, we got the captain in the building. 
<laughs> what's going on, Captain? Hey, what's going on? I just got one question for uh, a comment and a question. Uh, right. I wasn't going to call in at all. Um, I think it was excellent work by Real Hebrew, almost only because of the uh, the subject matter. The part that I paid attention to the most was when it came to the prophecy portion. The Real Hebrew not only showed scripture, but he showed the historical documentation to back up what he was saying. And Sanchez's rebuttal to that was a, to a uh, filibuster for about four minutes, and he gave up six minutes of his time instead of countering the information that Gorilla Hebrew was bringing. When you're doing a debate on a subject, you have to be able to rebut what the other person brings out to show how it's either false or correct, whichever one. And he didn't do that. And in the realms of a debate, you cannot give up your time without fully rebutting anything that he gave. So that kind of is like how the debate went, so to speak. But my question is to Sanchez, he made a statement that a bird, a dove floated onto a cross. I just wanted to know chapter and verse that that occurred. He was making a he was making a comparison of the doggone tribe having some dove floating right. on the cross or landing on a cross. So can you show me chapter and verse of where that is biblical? Okay, so what I'll do, I'll answer your last question first, and I'll go back to your first comment. Um, I didn't ever say it that was in Christian scripture. I said I was dealing with Christian art. A lot of what we're taught about the Bible comes from imagery too. And according to you guys, that's why so many of us think Jesus was white, right? So we must admit that a lot of the teaching came through images as well. Um, during the time of Noah, for example, they give us images of modern animals, but during the time of Noah, he would have been taken in saber toothed tigers and shit. Uh, if you want to really do the uh, the uh, evolution timeline and, and get your research on, on that. So many people t interpret it that way because of the image it's shown. Now you can say they're wrong for that or they're right for that, but that's another argument. Just to the first thing that you were saying about predictions, I brought up a lot of what my argument was, was to prove that it was planning and not predictions. So I spent a lot of my time uh, showing you how the enemy plans in advance. We all know that the future is being built today. That right there was a nail in the coffin. Let me explain something to you. I rebutted prophecy with planning. The Mayan calendar was said to be prophetic, but the Mayans were people who had to plan over long periods of time. They understood the patterns of nature. They can predict certain storms. It wasn't prophecy the meteorologist and isn't a prophet he knows the patterns of the weather and what i'm saying excuse me uh, captain talking, can you put your phone on mute right quick while you talking well, i'm sorry okay my bad i went you must hear my back yeah, my what, bad. What, were, they, were they able to hear me yeah yeah we hear you okay i hope he didn't interrupt it let me say salute to the captain uh it's unfortunate it couldn't have been me and him today i think it would have been more of a challenge no disrespect to gorilla hebrew but uh when I think when Captain heard me on the phone and saw that I just wasn't a typical debater, to me, I think uh, he thought otherwise about it. But I may <laughs> be wrong about it. I, I may be wrong about it. But I, I want you to know, Captain Tazari, man, salute to you. Maybe in the future, man, you can, you know what I'm saying, have a debate or whatever, bro. All I right. tried to unmute my phone. I, I pre just want one more thing before I close out. Anybody watching what Sanchez was saying before I called, he clearly said uh, the Bible has the dove, not Christianity. And that goes to the point of um, what I was talking about when it comes to debating. Gorilla Hebrew was very specific. We're talking about the Bible. We ain't talking about the Mayans. We ain't talking about the Hyundai. We ain't talking about nothing. The subject matter was, does the Bible talk about prophecy or is it planning? So Gorilla Hebrew pulls out the scriptures and the history, it's Sanchez's job to say no. When they did that in that portion of history and go to the same thing Gorilla Hebrew, chapter and verse, said this was planned because they knew this, because they knew that. And Gorilla Hebrew was uh, specific to point out how the prophets wasn't rich, they wasn't wealthy, they wasn't men in power or anything like that. They were men of God, and he was able to show that. So Sanchez didn't counter that. And like I said, and then I'll go because I know you probably got other callers. There is no chapter and verse of a dove landing on no damn cross. That's the problem when unlearned men 
grab hold of that Bible. You're no different than the white man that abused it. You're further abusing it and misleading the people. I suggest everybody get out the way and let the Israelites teach. Shalom. Damn, hold up, Captain. Hold up, man. Yeah. Hold up. Yeah. Brother, you yeah. all up in here tonight, man. Are you preparing yeah. for um Pastor Bennett for Friday, brother, or are you just going to take him lightly? No, I don't what take no opponent lightly. What can the people expect from you? A slaughter, a 3 0, a, a, a sweep coming Friday? What's up, man? I would, I would never think that much of myself to boast like that. The scriptures say if we're going to boast, we boast in the most high. Right. So all I'm going to do is study. All I'm going to do is study. The subject is, can a woman teach men? Not can a woman prophesy or be a prophet, anything like that, but can she teach men? And is the white man a devil according to the Bible? So I'm going to study. And through the power of the most high, I'll reign supreme. He gets the glory. You know, Captain Zaria, you know, that's just a name. Who gives a fuck about him? All that matters is the most high rank name reigns supreme, and that's who's going to win. And then we'll put Pastor Bennett in his place. Now, the, the carnality in me is the only thing I'll say is Pastor Bennett stay getting his ass whipped by men and women. So, I mean, I don't know what to, what to expect from that. But hey, so, um, that's all I got to say. But I'm, I'm a roll. I, I, you know, I don't want to get in too much. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and roll. But uh, nice work, Gorilla. Nice work. Look, this is what I wanted to say to Captain while he listening in. You choose your battles widely, uh, wisely, Captain. You, you, you backed out of a debate with me, but you called in like you wanted smoke. Um, this is what I'm going to say to the uh, Captain. We know he just caping because he's a Hebrew Israelite. You know what I'm saying? And he got the right to do that. But I just think they've been biased me personally, and I don't think he literally want to uh, debate me himself. That's all I'm going to say to that brother, and I'm challenging him to a debate. That's really what I wanted to do. All right. So, my brothers, which one of y'all would like to close out first? Brother Sanchez, being that you opened up, which one of y'all want to close out first? You look, you look sleepy now, Gorilla. He, he, he got it. He can go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I I'm, probably, I'm still. I probably, had about, I probably had about three hours of sleep today, man. I had a lot going on. Yeah, go ahead and close out, Gorilla. Go ahead and close out. But yeah, man. Um, of course, again, I just give all praise, honor, and glory to the Most High God, Yahweh, in the name of His only begotten Son, Yahweh Shai. I appreciate my brother Sonnet as usual, man. Like I, like I mentioned earlier, man. We started doing this about seven years ago, man. Going strong. You know, um, you know, got a lot of things coming. I want to quick plug my clothing line. I got one of the pieces on right now, Urban Gorilla. That's U R B N G R L A dot com, or you can follow that same. That's thing. the shirt you got on. Yeah, you see it, it like. Yeah, hold it up. Oh, okay, okay. Uh oh. So, uh, uh, we got all. I see the chain too. Baba Heru made oh, that yeah. chain. No, nah, no, nah, this is my brother Bazak and my oh, candy. Oh, I thought Baba Heru made that chain. Man. It kind of looked like a Baba Heru joint. I got to get me, but uh, you know, so. Uh, Right now in Atlanta, I actually, um, earlier today, where I was just coming from before the debate, was actually looking at um, a school building. So most I will, I'll be closing that deal um, this week, and we'll have a, we're gonna have a grand opening out here in Atlanta for our, uh, for our school. So, you know, I, I'll keep you abreast um, as, far as, uh, as far as that go, you know. But, uh, but you know, I appreciate it. Uh, glad to interact with my brother, uh, brother Sanchez. Man, I remember the first time he kind of popped up when he was debating Jabari on the Flat Earth. I remember watching that, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, and the cold thing is, you know, listen, I'm not going to say one of the other, but here to say, y'all need to stop debating flat earthers, man. I'm going to just keep it, be honest with you. Just leave, just go ahead and leave that alone <laughs> because I'm going to tell you, there's going to be some questions that's going to get asked that you're not going to be able to answer. <laughs> you ain't going to be able to go to no science, no nothing. You just ain't going to be able to answer. You feel me? So up, big up to Sam Tears, you know what I mean? Definitely a pleasure uh, uh, building with this brother. I hope everybody out there was edified, man. Um, you know, again, appreciate the sign. With that, again, all praise to the most high strong. All right, peace. Brother Sanchez, close out. All right, I just want to say salutes to everybody out there. Oh, so I wish we could have touched on the age of the earth, but I know we got to get up out of here. Go ahead, go yeah. in right quick. How much time you gonna, you need? Probably like two minutes. I was go just ahead. gonna tell people go to go, go research tree rings. If you want to know that the earth is older than 7,000 years old, go research tree rings because each ring of a tree marks one year and there are trees out there with thousands of rings. Uh, some of the oldest ones got 12,000 
500 rings and other trees like the redwood oaks in California, some are 14,000 years old, just a tree. And the rings can prove that. Uh, but, but that's just something else. And one thing to Captain, if he's listening, the Holy Ghost descended onto Jesus in the form of a dove or as a dove, the symbol for the Holy Ghost was a dove. I, that's what I was referring to in the scripture, but I was really wanting to deal with the sacred geometry. Let me say that you keep doing what you're doing, my brother, Gorilla Hebrew, because at the end of the day, I, I may not agree with the Bible, but I grew up in the Bible belt as a Christian. And it did. And, it, you know, a lot of times when my friends was getting shot up in the streets, I was in Bible study, man. So I, I'm not going to never make the argument that it, it may not uh, save a lot of our brothers lives. But I will say that there's a we got to move forward in our paradigm, I think, is one form of our uh, steps of progression as we trying to become, quote unquote, enlightened. But um, I'm not going to say nothing more to Captain Tazariak other than quit running from the debate. And to my brother, Gorilla Hebrew, I got mad respect to you, man. Y'all keep doing what you're doing, my brother. Salutes to you, man. All right, peace. Thank y'all, brothers. Y'all can see yourself out. All right. All right, once again, thank y'all, man. We got this. Um, <clears throat> we got Zion Lex tomorrow. I mean, yes, we got Zion Lex tomorrow. And I, I want to um, thank everybody who had donated. We have made that mark. Let me get it. Let me get a, um, a new one to show the people. Thank everybody who have came through. Through. Nepal, you want to come through? You want to call in? You got a message? Sister Nepal, you said you had a message today? You got a message today, Sister Nepal? Sister Nepal, I'm calling you. You got a message today? Remember you said you wanted to say something about the donation or something like that? You have a powerful message today. What's up, Nepal? I'm trying to wait. Nepal, do you have a message? There she go. Hold on, hold on. All right, we, we uh, peace and black power family. What's your name and where you calling from? <laughs> Let me mute out my, my YouTube. My name is Napasha Da, and I am a sister, a part of the House of Consciousness, and I'm calling in the first day. Much love to the family. Um, I was talking to Sonetta today and uh, speaking to him about his, the studio. Can you hear me okay? We hear you. Okay. And, you know, I was shocked when the brother told me, because he is very humble. He's like, well, you know, the studio will probably be uh, up and running next year. And I was like, why? He said, because the donations, I think your goal is what, 10,000, Uh, 15. What's your goal? 15. And I said, well, we can get that by this year. I mean, even if everybody just gave $10, that's it. Like, if each one of the people that are tuning in gave $10, then other people don't have to worry about giving 100 or 200 as many viewers that tune in, y'all, we can build that up. We can do it because it would be great to just all of us participate, the ones that really are serious and that are really showing love. I'm not, you know, nobody's putting pressure on anybody in these hard times, but $10. Right. I mean, that's a sandwich or a drink, uh, you know, a drink. So let's do that, you guys, because next year is ridiculous. That, that is doable. So I just wanted to say that, throw that out there to the family. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Nepal. Appreciate you. Okay. Yeah. Much love. Shalom. Peace. Black power. Peace. Peace. All right, family. That's Sister Nepal. Um, I agree with her 100%. I've been saying that all the time. Like if our people was just to, if everybody together was to say, you know what, here go five or here go 10, we don't have to have one person coming up with a hundred or 200. You know what I'm saying? 
everybody throwing five or ten dollars, and we got it. This is what the so-called Jews do. This is what they people do. Something happened within their community, or they want to get something going. They get that shit within a goddamn day or two. And y'all know I'm not. Y'all know I'm telling the truth because they all participate in it. Check. They all participate in it. We got to do the same thing. That's all we're saying. So we made it to the four mark and we passed it. Show some love, man, for the donations. Anybody who would like to contribute $10 tonight. It would definitely be helpful. We could get that. Shit, I could have that, that thing running this year. If we could get that business running this year, awesome. All right, so peace and black power family. We out of here, man. Peace. Hit that, hit that GoFundMe link. Peace. We out.